Bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't bet. I don't bet. I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners. And I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, powered by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the fifth and final Power 5 conference preview in anticipation of college football. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only Pain Insider. But before we get things kicked off here, I want to remind all of you, our loyal listeners, go to FanDuel.com, use the promo code BETTHEBOARD, take advantage of your no-sweat-free bet up to $1,000, whether you're betting college football win totals, you're getting involved in the NFL preseason, you're betting a little NASCAR on the heels of Stay Green, FanDuel has you covered for each and every sports betting offering. FanDuel.com, use the promo code BETTHEBOARD. And Payne, I know it's always a little bit bittersweet for you when we get to the final preseason preview as far as college football is concerned. Are you going to be able to contain your sorrow when we wrap this up after we deep dive nine teams in the SEC? More than nine. Nine plus a few others. All I will say is buckle up. This will probably be the longest preview of the five that we do. Everything is time stamped, each team. So grab a snack, grab your favorite beverage, and let's get this party started, buddy. We figure, you know what, when you put out all of these podcasts, all about anywhere from an hour and a half to north of two hours like this one in most likely will be, you break it up, you're sitting on the beach, you're going on those final family vacations, it's the perfect way to get yourself ready for the season, and Payne, no better place to start in the SEC than with the defending national champions the Georgia Bulldogs, who see their win total at FanDuel Sportsbook sitting at 10.5. You do have to lay a pretty monstrous price at minus 250, should you like to go over that win total. They're plus $1.60, so it has him second in line to win the SEC. And I guess the overarching question when you're looking at the way the program is trending in Athens, how quickly and how easily does Georgia change its mentality to having an urgency level going from not just being the hunter to suddenly now having a giant target on their back? Georgia is one of only four schools along with Alabama, Clemson, and Ohio State that have now reached two national championships since 2014 when the playoff era kicked off. 15 Bulldogs were selected in the draft, an NFL record, and new faces could mean less complacency, so it could be a blessing in disguise for a roster not used to defending the mountaintop. I'm going to give the onus up to you. Do we start with the Stetson Bennett fan club and look at Georgia offensively or try and figure out what this defense will look like replacing so many familiar faces? We try to stay away from the talk show radio host topics, but I think you made a more interesting point there before we get into both sides of the ball, and it's that Georgia's replacing 15 NFL draft picks and five coaches. And it's interesting from the perspective that most think Kirby got the proverbial monkey off his back winning a national championship, and to a large degree did. But Kirby wants Georgia to be thought of on par with Alabama. But this is truly the first time Kirby's success has forced him to deal with this much turnover where Saban's proven he can rinse and repeat no matter how much talent gets drafted or how many coaches get plucked away. So I think that's an interesting storyline to watch this year and moving forward for Georgia and Kirby. Yeah, I mean, any year Nick goes out there and finishes up the regular season an inevitable playoff run, he knows he's most likely going to have to replace his offensive and defensive coordinator, which puts Alabama in a different spot. Of course, we'll get to the Crimson Tide preview a little bit later on. But to your point, this will be a Georgia team that'll look a lot different with some of their personnel. And when you look at Georgia, so much was made about how good this team was defensively, but they still ranked fourth in the nation and first in the SEC last year in yards per play. The Georgia offense, if you don't count defense and special teams, scored scored the 10th most points in the nation a season ago, averaging 36 per game. But the offense was put in an advantageous spot more often than not. This was a group that never really had to drive the length of the field because the defense and special teams always gave them a short field to work with. And when you look at Georgia, when the offense took over, 
over on its own 25-yard line or worse, which happened about half the time. Georgia's touchdown rate last season, paying on those drives, slipped to 28%, 38th best rate in the nation. But when you're talking about Georgia, when they started in very good field position, I mean, this was a team that was going to make it count. And now suddenly Stetson Bennett has got the national championship ring. He's laid claim to the starting job, but this will be his sixth season at Georgia and seventh in college football. Can Stetson Bennett take another step in his development and make this Georgia offensive group even that much more dynamic? I think Georgia's offense is really interesting from the amount of production it does return. I think there's arguably more talent and the players have more defined roles this season, to your point, with Stetson Bennett coming into the year, knowing he's the man. I am interested to see how the offensive side of the ball deals with being relied upon more because there's undoubtedly going to be more pressure on Stetson Bennett and the offense to score. There's not a lot of pressure to produce points when your defense gives up 10 a game. So there's (laughs) going to be situations this season where Georgia won't be able to play safe offensively and that's a little bit out of Kirby's comfort zone now the reason we were able to cash some bets on Georgia pretty frequently last season and did so in the national championship game for our listeners here is the perception offensively didn't match reality because nobody liked a a sixth year walk-on quarterback that wasn't uber talented but Stetson Bennett was actually third among SEC quarterbacks in total EPA added. More than Hendon Hooker, more than everyone's favorite KJ Jefferson. Okay. Don't get Only me started Bryce. on KJ. We're gonna have time to get there. Don't get me started. Bryce Young and Will Rogers contributed more expected points for their team than Stetson Bennett in the SEC. That was it. Georgia was also number one in the entire country in opponent adjusted EPA per pass. Now, by no means is Stetson Bennett a lead, even though we we are the creators of his fan club. But he probably, you know, and he's not going to contribute anything at the next level, I wouldn't think. I think when you look at him as a college quarterback, it's pretty crystal clear that he's a fantastic point guard. He knows where the ball needs to go. He's willing to attack all areas of the field, pretty evident by the yards per pass attempt and ADOT numbers. He's got above average accuracy, above average arm strength, sneaky athletic, which allows him to contribute with his legs and defenses have to prepare for that part of his game. Again, like he's not elite. He's probably not even great, but I do think he's more than a game manager. And the biggest question I think for George's offense is simple. Stetson Bennett didn't throw a lot. He actually attempted 48% less, less pass attempts than Bryce Young. Didn't throw from very many negative situations. And you kind of alluded to that with starting field position. But Georgia, like within the confines of its offense, faced the shortest yards to go on third down in the entire country at 5.9. They only converted at a rate outside the top 40 in college football. So that's a metric certainly pointing towards Stetson Bennett needing to be more in positive situations. And I think he'll be in less plus EV situations this season. And that's maybe where some struggles could occur. Kind of going quickly through the position groups, running back, you lose your top two. But McIntosh has been all the hype this spring. He actually had the best elusive rating last season of any Georgia running back. He also graded out the best pass blocking back, and we saw him catch a ball 40 yards downfield in the (laughs) spring game. So he's going to fill that Cooks role pretty well. Branson Robinson, a top five back from the 2022 class, is someone that can contribute year one. Kendall Milton still there as well. Wide receiver room has premium talent with lots of upside. Let's see if there's a go-to guy that eventually emerges. You have Lad McConkey averaged more than 2.7 yards per route run. Adonna Mitchell poised for a sophomore breakout, had arguably the biggest catch of Georgia's season last year. Karis Jackson's back, brings some experience. And then you have Arian Smith, who has track speed. And I mean, like, track star speed like it is elite speed tight end group easily the best in the country Brock Bowers will be healthier after offseason shoulder surgery that bugged him down the stretch last season average nearly 3.1 yards per route run as a true freshman then you have five-star Eric Gilbert returned this spring after taking a year off and despite not being in the best shape he literally came into camp 300 pounds they said he needed to lose about 55 he was halfway there in the spring game and he still dominated the spring game and then you have darnell washington as well o-line keeps landing four and five star big men top shelf talent there's some good depth there three of five starters return broderick jones has potential to be the best of the group he's basically the reason Amarius Mims was looking to transfer out the schedule of defenses Georgia will face isn't too grueling either for the entire season the average projected defensive efficiency rank of Georgia's opponents 66th 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not that optimistic about anything that Georgia has as far as wide receivers, but you highlighted a position group that's a matchup nightmare for opposing defensive coordinators. If Eric Gilbert looks like the player I think LSU anticipated him to be when he originally committed there, you talk about Brock Bowers, we saw Darnell Washington. I mean, there are still plenty of guys to make big plays down the field for this Georgia team. Now, of course, last year, the offenses, you, you kind want of... Some, you want some scoop, by the way? Oh, I always like scoop. Lay it on me. The the car accident uh, that Amarius Mims' best friend tragically passed in, which then sent him back to Georgia instead of landing at Florida State, him and Darnell Washington are best of buds. And uh, my understanding was that was going to be a, a package deal, and Florida State desperately needs tight end help. So that would have been very interesting. Um how that ultimately unfolded. Somewhere along the way, you guys will land a prestigious recruit down there in Tallahassee again. Let's get to the defense, you jerk. (laughs) All right. When you look at the defense, Glenn Sherman, defensive coordinator, obviously has a tough act to follow when you consider how good this Bulldogs defensive front was and at all three levels a season ago. When you look at Georgia last year, Payne, opponents were more likely to lose five yards on a given drive than they were to actually score a touchdown. Opponents scored touchdowns on only 7.8% of drives a season ago, 14 times out of 179 opportunities. They went backward five or more yards on 9% of the drives for 16 drives. So it just puts in perspective that level of dominance. And when you're talking about a Georgia team that has recruited at a very high level, it's brought in a ton of NFL caliber talent, you do wonder about the defensive... Uh, the defensive difference makers and where some of those players are going to come from. But if we start at the defensive line, I mean, everything you read about Georgia and you listen to the player comments, you read what the coaches have to say, they're saying Jalen Carter might have been the most talented member of that Georgia defense a season ago. He's back and it just continues to get better and better as you go down the list with maybe some of the questions coming at the linebacker position if we want to nitpick. Yeah, I mean, listen, we, we've kind of alluded to the fact that Georgia's offense will have more pressure on them this season, and that means one thing, right? That after eight defensive starters were drafted, we're expecting regression from the dogs' defense. That's not really a question. Regression is going to happen. I think the actual question is, what does the regression look like? Does it Georgia go from an all-time historic defense to a top five unit, or does it dip all the way down to a top 15 unit? And I think that's ultimately the question, you know, we're asking here. And I'm not quite sure what the answer is. I would actually gravitate towards the latter, that it's probably not a top five unit. You think about that Georgia defense last season, and that was a crazy stat you rattled off at the top. But through 11 games, they were surrendering 0.36 non-garbage time points per drive. All told, they gave up eight regular season touchdowns. Georgia's defense finished number one in each of these metrics. EPA per play, EPA per pass, rushing success rate, early down EPA, quality possessions, points per quality possession, big play rate, and forced third down rate. It is impossible to sniff those numbers this season. And nobody's feeling bad for Kirby, right? The talent's there. The question is... Will it be ready? And watching the spring game, I wonder if there's enough contributing depth. There were times where the third team offense was giving it to the second team defense and listening to Kirby this offseason, he's hinted at being unsure of both the linebacker group and overall defensive depth. Who's the leader defensively? You know, who's holding everyone accountable? Who's the guy that gets everyone lined up? Who's the guy that erases everyone's mistakes? N'Kobe Dean was that all-in-one guy and was the heart of Georgia's defense. And past the intangibles uh, above the shoulders, you listen to some of these numbers. I mean, averaged a 26% pressure rate on pass rush snaps, recorded a stop on more than 19% of run snaps, nearly 325 coverage snaps. He only allowed a 43 passer rating. I mean, N'Kobe Dean's a massive loss, great snag by the Eagles. I look at the three horses Kirby has returning. You mentioned Jalen Carter. He's probably the best of the bunch. He probably is the most talented defender, even among last year's group. You do have Nolan Smith and you have Christopher Smith. Um, Jalen Carter and Nolan Smith combined to have a 13% pressure rate or stop rate. 
Christopher Smith is an elite cover safety. You do have Tyke Smith, the safety transfer from West Virginia, only played seven snaps last season due to injury. He's back. Keely Ringo is the number one corner in the 2020 class, made a huge leap last season. Dalen Everett, the five-star freshman, is in the mix to start at corner as well. I think the concern, and you hinted at it, would be if Georgia can remain stout up the middle. Warren Brinson takes on that Jordan Davis role. Dumas Johnson and Tresman Marshall will be, you know, tasked with not having, you know, the linebacker room regress too much. Just based on experience and prior production and depth that's actually ready to contribute, I think there's a ton of questions. And some of them are going to get answered out of the shoot against Oregon, an offense that we project to flirt with the top 15. But here's what's interesting about Georgia overall, Todd. We're starting their power rating seven points lower than where it ended last season. But they're still at least an eight and a half point favorite (laughs) in every single game based on our preseason projections because they avoid Bama. They avoid A&M, LSU, and Ole Miss. And sometimes it's hard for the casual fan that listens to this podcast when we call for regression. But because of the schedule, the wins and losses may not reflect a team that we have weaker by a full touchdown. It seems to be one of those cliches, and I'm not sure if it resonates most with college football fans or more NFL fans, and we say it until we're blue in the face, that a team could be better game to game, but it may not show up in the win-loss column. In college, we know that schedules aren't created equally. Even in the NFL, they're not. So I think oftentimes, if you're a fan and you're judging the team's merits just on their win-loss record, we understand where those folks are coming from. But for what we do and how we try and educate every single podcast throughout the course of the fall, it's trying to see the forest through the trees and break through some of that. So to your point, while Georgia looks like they have all the makings of a team that should run the table and go 12-0 and during the regular season, we don't expect this team to be as good as what we saw last year and of course so many questions will be answered not just week one but when they get into the thick of things fortunately for Georgia though they do battle against the SEC East and don't have to go through the grind of SEC West opponents there's no doubt about that I think that's ultimately the thing to keep in mind here and again just because you're favored in all 12 games you're going to go out there and translate the point spread projection to a money line and that equates to about 11 wins and so even though you see a number at FanDuel of over 10 and a half it does come with that minus 210 price tag which is more than actually 11 wins so there's really not a ton of value uh, going over 10 and a half even though the actual number projection is 11 for us yeah exactly so there's better ways to attack teams that are at the top of the heap and as far as Georgia to your point I don't think there's a ton of wiggle room to do a whole heck of a lot uh, especially when you're looking at the season with a composite snapshot. If you're looking to try and identify some of Georgia's biggest competition, there are three teams that are kind of a muddled mess, and you can take your pick if you think any of them are capable of knocking Georgia from their perch. And we'll start in Knoxville with the Tennessee Volunteers, whose win total sits at 7.5 at FanDuel Sportsbook. You do, however, have to lay $1.70 to go over that number if you believe the Vols can get to 8-4 and four or better. When you're looking at Tennessee's price to win the conference, 50-1 to one long shot the tag for Josh Heupel's bunch. And when you look at what Heupel was able to do in his first season, he took a very dysfunctional program and turned them into anything but uh, a season ago. Finished the campaign 7-5 and five during the regular season, 7-6 and six overall. With single season school records of 511 points and 67 touchdowns, Heupel is one of only four Tennessee coaches since 1941 to win at least seven regular season games. And when you look at the way that Tennessee is trying to go about their recruiting and get their collectives together, a lot of reason for optimism about some of the quarterback talent they'll bring in. We can ignore some of the off-field transgressions that broke light last week about some of the NCAA sanctions and figure out what the lasting ramifications will be from all of that. But this is a Tennessee team, Payne, who brings Hendon Hooker back. We've seen him get a little bit of Heisman. Buzz is a real long shot out there who broke the under center. He set his program record with 181.4 passer efficiency and a 68% completion percentage. Hooker's not going to have all of his weapons at his disposal, but it's a second year in the system and reason to believe that he can continue to develop chemistry with some of the guys in the wide receiver group, specifically Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman. Tennessee's offense is is the obvious strength, and, and you mentioned some of those records that Heupel and Hooker set last year. I mean, it was for total points, touchdowns, total yards, and the crazy part, 
those numbers would have been even more flattering had Hendon Hooker started from the onset. And the one thing Let it I be really known, do, we were pounding the drum for Hendon Hooker early in the season <laughs> instead of the Joe Milton experience. That's for damn sure. I mean, Joe Milton wouldn't even have been at Tennessee had someone listened to a podcast two years prior when he was at Michigan. <laughs> um, so Tennessee's offense, the thing I really like about it, it's, it's multiple. You know, it's it's up tempo, it's RPO based. They can be physical at times with the extra man advantage in the box because Hooker's mobile. And then Tennessee also likes to hunt big shots off play action vertically. So it it, it is a really nice offense. I think Ken and Hooker obviously exceeded everyone's expectations, including Josh Heupel's. So it's it's difficult to maybe project that kind of season. And I mean, you look at these metrics, you would be hard pressed to really find any problem areas, whether Hooker was under pressure, whether he was blitzed, intermediate throws, deep throws, off play action. It didn't matter. Hendon Hooker was elite last year. And the word out of spring ball is, and this is important if you're kind of projecting some regression, supposedly Hooker's taken his game to the next level. He's using his eyes better to disguise things. He's getting to his second and third reads quicker. So those are some things that maybe doesn't have this very quarterback friendly system that's usually like paint by numbers. Maybe it takes another step because he's added some of these things to his repertoire. Now, I think the conversation that's better to have regarding Tennessee's offense is not if it's going to be great, but what would be the things that would prevent it from being a top five offense in the country? And I've identified two areas. The first is Tennessee's O-line. It does return four starters. There'll be a battle for one of the opening tackle positions between Dane Davis, Jeremiah Crawford, and the Gators transfer Gerald Mincy. Let's see how that plays out in fall camp. But kind of the point here is the returning production actually has to produce. Heupel's system and, and Hooker's dual threat ability really hid some deficiencies. And you see that in the line yards, in the stuff rate metrics. But when it came to known situations, the Vols offensive line crumbled a bit last season. They were horrific in short yardage. They were 79th in power success rate. And that's a measure of the percentage of runs on third and fourth down with two or less yards to go that produced a first down or a touchdown. In known passing situations, Tennessee was 126th in sack rate allowed. Those two things are why Tennessee's offense barely cracked the top 40 in late down success rate. That has to get fixed if Tennessee wants to be a top five offense. The other potential problem area that the Vols have to solve, and you hinted at this at the top, is finding a reliable pass catcher to complement Cedric Tillman. What Tillman did last season was off the charts. 17 yards a catch is a deep threat with only a 4% drop rate is uber impressive. In games that Hooker started, Tillman averaged nearly three yards per route run. But who's the running mate? And you mentioned Jalen Hyatt. He is the speedster. He's a top 200 receiver from the 2020 class. He's been all the rave this spring. Apparently, the light turned on for him where he showed up to camp 15 pounds heavier but didn't lose the 4-3 speed. That's vital because Brew McCoy, the four-star USC transfer, hasn't been granted eligibility yet. There was a situation basically where Brew's freshman year, he enrolled at USC, transferred to Texas for spring, practiced with Texas, hated it, and then transferred back to USC during the summer uh, before playing a single game. The NCAA is working on that situation. Like many situations, the NCAA is <laughs> What is, is the NCAA on? not working on right about now? <laughs> right. And, and those situations typically don't get solved overly quickly. So hopefully Brew McCoy doesn't have to sit out the season. It would be a blow to the Vols receiver room for sure. Offensively, the Vols will see Saban and Kirby on the schedule. So those defenses are tough, but obviously we're calling for a little regression from, from Georgia's defense. But the other 10 defenses have a projected average efficiency rank of 73. So I, I think this offense gets back to humming. Hopefully the offensive line gets a little bit better situationally and Brew McCoy gets granted eligibility. Yeah, when you look at uh, Tennessee as well, the running back position, I don't think it is a major point of emphasis by any stretch of the imagination. You lose a guy like Tyon Evans who transfers to Louisville. Uh, Jabari Small had kind of become that guy, but I think it's kind of plug and play there if the passing game gets going, especially given the element that Hendon Hooker gives you with his legs. Now, for all of the positive accolades you could heap on Tennessee and Josh Heupel's first season offensively, 
the defense didn't exactly live up to its end of the bargain. Set a school record for 102 tackles for loss, but the group was all about trying to create disruption, even if it led to big plays on the back end, and they gave up more than 40 points five times last season. They were 101st in the FBS and third down success rate allowed, a robust 42% against, which placed them 13th in the SEC. Now, of course, we know with this system, the defense is supposed to create those havoc plays, force a turnover, because if they're out there for a lot of downs, it's going to create problems. I mean, the reality of it is uh, they were out there as much as any defense in a Power 5 conference a season ago, but when you look at Tennessee defensively, can they do more to get into the backfield, create some of those plays, uh, and maybe get that change of momentum they need for their offense? It's tough, right? Like, I mean, Tennessee lost three of its top four graded defenders. I think the hope is that in the second year of Tim Banks 425 system that plays too high, that they improve a little bit just based on cohesion. I mean, the Vols aren't going to be the 85 Bears here. But if you can go from being a top 50 defense to flirting with the top 30, that's a massive leap. You know, just a couple more stops that get your offense the ball back would be huge. The biggest fix, though, could be situationally. It is wild seeing a dichotomy this large, and it's partly because of those negative plays they were creating that you mentioned. But Tennessee had a regular season defense that was top 15 in preventing first downs and early downs. The Vols were also top 35 in EPA per play on early downs in the regular season, but they couldn't get off the field on third or fourth down outside the top 100 and late down success rate when opponents had quality possessions. They scored nearly five points per quality possession. Tennessee was an uh, absolute sieve when offenses got inside their green zone. So there's potential for some positive regression, just fixing things situationally. Up front, Byron Young and and Tyler Barron return at defensive ends. That's a nice duo there. Those two combined to create a pressure on more than 13% of pass rush snaps. Up the gut, Tennessee had to replace Matthew Butler Let's see if guys like Amari Thomas and Latrell Bumpfus can can help in expanded roles there. Would be nice if Tyree West, the high-end four-star tackle Tennessee landed at the 23rd hour in the 2022 class, can contribute early. Linebacker group isn't great, but it's possible. Jeremy Banks takes another step since he was still learning the position as a converted running back last year. There's experience in the room. What would really shift the linebacker group from being a liability to solid is if Juwan Mitchell, the former Texas Longhorn linebacker, can get things together between the ears. He had shoulder surgery last season. He's healthy now. He has the best pedigree in that backer room. Secondary has solid parts with Warren Burrell and Trayvon Flowers. Past that, there's some some question marks. You know, Jalen McCullough has experience, but he's regressed every single season for three straight seasons. McCullough was the worst tackling safety in the SEC among those with at least 900 snaps, and he was a liability in coverage. Two guys in the back end transfer in with Wesley Walker from Georgia Tech. He's the projected starter at nickel, but only has one positive graded season in coverage over three years. Andrew Turntine, I think, is the wild card to this unit. He's a four-star top 200 kid from Tennessee that chose to go to Ohio State, got homesick, and transferred back. If Tennessee makes strides defensively this season, it'll happen because of of three things, right? They don't get bullied as much up the middle. The secondary is able to get off the field in known passing situations on third down. And in the green zone, the Vols don't completely break this year. But this is still a unit that is probably somewhere in that, you know, 35 to 50 range. I'll give Tennessee credit. They went out and they uh, tried to change their program completely. It was one of the most boring watches every single Saturday throughout the fall. Josh Heupel gave them that infusion of life. And even if they're still a couple cuts away from competing with Georgia in terms of the SEC East, the program is headed in a much better direction now than it would have been when we were recording the podcast last year when we had a lot of skepticism about the combination of Josh Heupel taking over with his former AD in charge of the Tennessee Athletic Department. So interesting team to watch. Booster support these days as well. Yep, they're all of a sudden a program that uh, had deep pockets to begin with, <laughs> suddenly starting to emerge from the shadows when you're luring a five-star quarterback prospect across the country uh, from USC to kind of take over. So it'll be interesting to watch to see where some of that trickle-down economics works as far as bolstering this group, both on the offensive and defensive line as well. 
from trickle ten- down economics. That might be a, a T-shirt. I, I like that. <laughs> trickle down economics. When you're looking at the rest of the SEC East landscape, another program that finds themselves in transition would be one of Tennessee's biggest historical rivals. And that, of course, is the Florida Gators. Down in Gainesville, you're looking at a win total of seven. You do have to lay a dollar fifteen to go over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, their odds to win the SEC 60 to one going into the season. And if we had to use one word to describe Florida football heading into 2022, I think inexperienced would probably be the most apropos. Billy Napier did an outstanding job at Louisiana, led them to a 40 and 12 record in four years, two Sun Belt championships, two top 16 finishes, three double digit win seasons, and four division titles. Since his arrival, Napier has done everything he can to surround himself with a massive, well researched staff, trying to instill structure and the players routines and scrutinizing every aspect of the program uh, coming off a six win season in the wake of the debacle that was the Dan Mullen experience. But when you look at this team right now, Payne, a lot of reason to be excited about their starting quarterback and Anthony Richardson, but up and down that roster, it doesn't quite look up to snuff even by SEC East standards. I like Billy Napier and I don't ultimately know what's going to come of his tenure there. But for some reason, fans are just so impatient. So he's lost a few recruiting battles this offseason and people are already trying to dump him. I just I don't get that right. There's there's few guys that can say they coached for Saban and Dabo. And then when they got the chance to be the man, inherited a five and seven team that was power rated outside our top 115. And within four years, that team finished 13 and one and was power rated in our mid 40s. Billy Napier can and he has full buy-in from Florida's administration. You mentioned that massive staff. They allowed him to build a 60-plus person coaching staff, one of the largest in the country. They had two offensive line coaches. When I mean, are you, it's, it's speaking unbelievable. Of which, when are you going to allow us to build a 60-person staff or on Bet the Board? It'd make our jobs a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. Right. Troops, troops are coming. Some troops are coming. We'll God, see. We have reinforcements, uh, <laughs> baby. Reinforcements for the fall. <laughs> So you kind of mentioned some of the things that Napier was implementing and to this point players seem to have bought in we'll see after you lose a few games but Napier's been all about efficiency he's buttoned up very scheme driven attention to detail you would expect Florida to to be prepared with a, a staff that large but I truly think unless Anthony Richardson has a Cam Newton like Heisman season it's going to take some time because there are clear holes on the Gators roster and a lack of depth virtually every year. You know, just there you you look at this roster, it doesn't matter where it is, you're like, eh, not really sure about like the second string. There's just very little depth. And then when I look at Anthony Richardson's game, and we've talked about him ad nauseum a little bit last season, and we weren't necessarily as high on him as as everyone else. And there's a reason why a guy that looks like that coming off the bus was a three-star recruit, because he did have some things to his game that weren't great. It does feel like a perfect fit, though, when you mesh his game with what Billy Napier wants to run. He's basically Levy Lewis on steroids. But one thing's pretty clear. Even with limited reps, if if Billy Napier can get Anthony Richardson to play on time, he's going to produce. And we saw glimpses of that last season. When Richardson was great, he released the ball within two and a half seconds. All hell broke loose when he held on to it for long periods and then threw late. Accuracy is probably a little bit of a question still, but I think working on mechanics and refining his feet that's going to help a little bit, but I just do worry about a guy who's only accurate on 54% of his passes and had an 8% interceptable pass rate. Those things are are hard to ignore. I do love Richardson's ability to be the extra man in the box with his legs. That'll create some problems. And if Napier trusts Jack Miller, the Ohio State transfer, and he did look good in spring, that's important to me because if Napier trusts Miller, then Napier won't have to limit the times Anthony Richardson can use his legs, and it's only going to help the offense more. I believe we're going to see a physical run game with how Florida's built right now. Four guys that played at least 350 snaps along the O-line last season are back. Osiris Torrance, one of the best linemen in the transfer portal this cycle, followed Napier to Florida from Lafayette. He has been all the buzz this summer, not only showing to be the best player on the O-line, but a leader and a teacher of the new system. Guys like Josh Braun and Camarion Waits are in the mix as well and both have experience. But you look 
at Napier's Cajuns last season. They were 57% early down run. They were 58% run overall. Now it's probably not going to be that high this season because of game flow and, and Florida trailing more than Lafayette last season. But make no bones about this. Napier wants to play a physical brand, and that'll be interesting because all Florida fans want is that Spurrier, you know, chuck it all over the park offense. It will be interesting to see how they adapt to this new style, and if it doesn't take off immediately, how receptive they're going to be to just giving this guy some time. Naquan Wright and Montrell Johnson are two capable young backs. I think where the issues lie offensively for Florida is with its pass catchers. If you watched footage from spring practice of the receiver room, it was ugly. I mean, like guys were having trouble, like getting in and out of cones. <laughs> it was in just like catching balls on air. And so <laughs> that, that group is you know, probably the worst in the SEC in terms of receiver groups. Justin Shorter is the best of that group. It would appear good hands, but 1.5 yards per route run from a guy that's supposed to be your best is, is tough. Ricky Persall transferred in late from ASU to provide another weapon in the spring game. Napier is trying to get tight end Keon zipper the ball at times in the wide receiver screen game. All signs point to this Gators offense being very much about X's and O's because really the only elite Jimmy or Joe they have is Anthony Richardson. The schedule is also extremely difficult. Top seven toughest in the country by our projections. There was sharp money under seven and a half on the Gators earlier this summer, and it's it's why we're at like 6.8 right now, Todd. The good thing for Florida is that they get all those growing pains out of their system in front of their fans. So you hope they don't turn on them as six out of Florida's first seven games will all take place in the swamp. So it'll be interesting to watch. And to your point, Gator fans who grew accustomed to the chuck and duck approach of Steve Spurrier back in the day, this is about a 180 degree turn for the way that Billy Napier wants to go about conducting business, especially on the offensive side. Now for Florida, a stop unit. They were awful in 2020 and they went to very average last season, struggled against the run and finished outside the top 50 in scoring defense. Not exactly what Gator faithful love to see. But again, we saw a ton of turnover for this team offensively. Defensively, there are questions that abound about depth, about difference makers. They're going to have to be patient because this Florida stop unit isn't going to resemble one ripe with NFL talent right out of the gates. They're going to switch to a 3-3-5 under Patrick Tony and Sean Spencer. There are some nice pieces here. The biggest question is right up the middle. There's serious concerns past Javon Dexter. Now, Dexter has the potential to be a first-round pick. He's got the length. He's got the strength to create some pressure and hold up against the run. But Florida was desperate for help on the interior to pair with Dexter, but struck out multiple times in the portal. Finally settled for a body in Tyron Truesdale from Auburn. If Truesdale can recapture his 2019 form, That'll help Florida in a big way up the middle. My feeling is that's questionable and why he had to transfer out from Auburn. On the edge, Princely needs to make that year three leap. Was damn good getting pressure as a spot pass rush specialist last season. 11% pressure rate on pass rush snaps and a 19% win rate. Let's see if he can keep that same production with expanded snaps. Brenton Cox is as solid as it gets from the outside linebacker position. Ventrell Miller has experience if the new coaching staff can unlock that 2018 and 19 production now that he's healthy it would be huge for the middle of the defense secondary feels like florida's strength just like it was a season ago when they finished top 20 in epa per pass allowed passing success rate allowed and late down success jason marshall out of miami was the number two corner in the 2021 class as a freshman allowed a 37 percent completion rate when targeted and a 59 passer rating jalen kimber transfers in from georgia he was a top 10 corner in the 2020 class Kimber's been the defensive star of spring ball. You have Rashad Torrance, who's a fantastic cover safety. Kamari Wilson, a top 50 player at safety in the 2022 class. He is a thumper that decommitted from Georgia and committed to Billy Napier late in that cycle. There are some real nice chess pieces to work with in the back there. But again, I go back to schedule. Gators are going to face three top 10 offenses. If you remove Vandy and Eastern Washington from the equation, the 10 big boy offenses Florida plays have a projected average efficiency of 33. You do also wonder if we see some trail off late in the season, if Jervon Dexter were to wear down on the interior or if there was some type of attrition. My feeling is some of the more physical opponents will be able to just gash Florida right up the middle, Todd. 
Yeah, and uh, we're going to see what Florida's got right out of the chute. Not exactly a soft landing spot for Billy Napier when it comes to non-conference opponents. They'll get Utah in their own building, a game that'll be a little bit later in the day. I'm sure Florida would love it to be a noon Eastern kickoff time with sweltering humidity. So Utah will hit you in the mouth, and it should be a fascinating way to see how far Florida's come during fall camp. But again, all you want to see if you're a Gators fan is growth and progress throughout the the course of the season. We know it can be an adjustment when you're changing systems, you're changing head coaches, and you're trying to figure out exactly what you've got. One final team in the SEC East that people have high expectations for in the 2022 season pain would be the Kentucky Wildcats. And when you look at Kentucky, their win total sits at seven and a half. You do need to lay a dollar forty should you like to go over at FanDuel Sportsbook. 40 to 1 long shots to win the SEC. And since Coach Stoops has taken over the reclamation project of all of college football, I mean, this program has really been on the rise. More money being allocated to facilities and coaches than I think a lot of people in the Bluegrass State ever thought possible for what's historically been a basketball first program. The last three non-pandemic seasons, Coach Stoops has gone 28 and 11. Kentucky went four decades between 10 win seasons, uh, given what they've accomplished over the last couple of years. We will see a little bit of changing personnel on the offensive side. Liam Cohen returns to his NFL roots in steps Rich Scangarello from the San Francisco 49ers to work with uh, Will Levis, who's projected by many to not just be a first round pick, but as a ceiling potentially of being a top 10 or even a top five guy. Problem being is Kentucky's going to have to build with an offensive line without both starting tackles and last year's center who bolted for the NFL. Wandale Robinson gone as well, who set a single season school record for catches and receiving yards. So when you're looking at Will Levis, trying to figure out what he can do, yes, his 24 touchdown passes were the most by a Kentucky quarterback since 2007. He completed 66 66- percent of his passes through for almost 2,900 yards and ran the ball for a shade under 400. What does Levis have to do for an encore and pain? Are you buying what everyone is trying to sell about his prospects at the NFL level? The interesting point you made there was for a program like Kentucky to lose its OC, its O-line coach, a second round receiver, and three starting offensive linemen, it would sound like a rebuild to most. But Will Levis is providing that hope and and maybe hype. And personally, I believe the right way to describe Will Levis is his production hasn't matched the natural ability, talent, or hype yet. We know he's got a rocket arm. Levis is mobile. His size and strength is off the charts. Players love him and gravitate towards him as a leader. There is a ton of upside, and he's going to look like a cool million at the Combine in shorts and a T-shirt. And he does project to be a top 10 pick if he continues this trajectory. But Levis still does need some improving. And it's to me, I don't want to shortchange him, but it is easier to look good to Kentucky faithful and college football diehards after we all watched receivers play quarterback for multiple seasons and celebrated any time they were able to complete a forward pass. Okay, <laughs> So <laughs> the question I think becomes is, is can Will Levis improve and yield a production level close to the hype? Because last season, which was a career year, Levis still had an 8% interceptable pass rate. For comparison, Bryce Young was 3% and Young was pressured more. Among qualifying quarterbacks, Will Levis was 44th in passer rating from a clean pocket. When he was under pressure, Will Levis was 71st in adjusted accuracy and 93rd in passer rating. For having an absolute cannon of an arm, Levis was 62nd in deep ball adjusted accuracy. So there are some things to clean up here. Okay. All things considered, I like the hire Mark Stoops made with which with Rich Scangarello, my understanding is Rich wants to run virtually the same offense Kentucky ran last season. Scangarello was under Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco as his quarterback coach. So you love that pedigree. I mean, you know, you make the comparison as, as Kentucky fans who probably like horse racing, like Kyle Shanahan is the secretariat of offensive minds. Like he's the best, like there's no one better. So being under him, learning from him, understanding those concepts, I think Rich is going to do quite well here. You mentioned the offensive line losing three starters, and they were the important kind, right? Kennard at right tackle was elite. Luke Fortner at center was all world. Dare Rosenthal was superb. And a fourth man and swing guard, Austin Dotson, was a 300-plus snap contributor who graded out extremely well. He's gone, too. Kenneth Horsey and Eli Cox return. Cox is going to transition from guard to center. That is a big move. 
And then you have Keonta Goodwin, the four-star true freshman tackle. He's going to be forced to start day one. Tyshawn Manning, the Auburn transfer, is solid at guard. Stoops was dying to add a tackle in the portal this summer. That did not happen. To me, the quality of this unit dwindles, and the depth is a real concern. There is going to be a large dip in production from a unit that finished top five in line yards and opportunity rate last season and only allowed less than 12% of runs to be stuffed. Weapons are interesting. Tavion Robinson transfers in from Virginia Tech. He's a solid slot receiver who rarely drops the ball. Dane Key, a four-star freshman, has been all the rave. You also have Baron Brown, a top 100 freshman at receiver. I would expect more passes to running backs from a Rich Scangarello offense as well. Chris Rodriguez is an elite college back, obviously. Top five in value added at the running back position over the last two seasons. Just needs to clean up the fumbles. Kentucky was minus 11 in turnover margin, partly because Rodriguez was a fumbling machine. He's a bulldozer, though. So he's he's typically in a lot of traffic. There's a lot of hands punching at the ball. I get it. But that just needs to be cleaned up. Over four yards per rush after contact. 17% of Rodriguez's runs gain 10-plus yards. He just keeps the pile moving. Jaton McLean is a name to remember, appears to be the leader in the clubhouse for that change of pace role and pass catcher out of the backfield. And the biggest thing, Kentucky only projects to face two top 25 defenses. Other 10 defenses project to have an average efficiency rank of 74th. But I just think there is some some missing parts here, Todd, offensively. And ultimately, we're not quite sure what Will Levis can be when the offensive line isn't perfect and he's maybe playing behind the down and distance a little bit because of the offensive line not generating the push it had last year and there's still question marks at receiver as well it's always interesting for a team to your point earlier that's grown accustomed to being a run first offense not having dynamic playmakers or a quarterback that coach stoops had a lean on to suddenly going hey look we're going to become a pass happy attack you saw some of those kinks in this team defensively because they were on the field significantly more and they were put under more positions of duress and as far as brad white's defense is concerned the wildcats will lose three difference makers three-year starting safety Yusuf Coker 240 career tackles three-year starting defensive end Josh Pascal, 37 career tackles for loss and a massive mound of a man in 379 pound nose guard Marcan McCall who the team and coaches referred to as a human bulldozer in the trenches in 2021 the defense came up with just 12 takeaways and three of them actually came in the bowl win over Iowa just one fumble recovery in the first eight games and there was only one takeaway in a through three-game losing streak for a defense that came up with multiple turnovers two times. So there are concerns on this particular group. I'm not of the mindset yet, Payne, that Kentucky can just continue to reload and rebuild defensively, but there is reason for hope and optimism that a lot of the recruits that are coming into Lexington now are four and five star recruits, so there won't be the same precipitous drop off that we would have grown accustomed to in the past. Yeah, I I, I want to see it, right? I mean, Speaking to recruiting specifically, I I know they recently won a battle for Avery Stewart, a safety who is a four-star guy, and my understanding is they had to pay more for him than another team that decided to allocate its resources to a five-star offensive lineman. So like those are the battles they're kind of winning right now. They're still not competing in the recruiting race, among others. Defense loses six starters linebacker group will be the strength secondary could be a real problem specifically corner defensive line has to grow up and all of those highly touted 2020 guys have to excel and expand at a role that's that's the short and skinny of kentucky's 2022 defense up front octavius oxendine has to be the real deal a guy that you can kind of plug in the middle in kentucky's three four base returning from a knee tear that ended last season uh short 200 plus snaps last season he was solid against the run justin rogers at nose guard is the highest rated recruit mark stoop has ever brought to kentucky he's a, he's a legit four-star guy junior year for him time to step up it would appear the light turned on for him from the florida game onward last season those two guys though are vital in taking on two guys and allowing your veteran linebacker group to get pressure and create some havoc something kentucky wasn't really able to do last season they were outside the top 100 and pressure rate kentucky secondary is full of questions 
Now, it does play a conservative keep in front zone style on the back. So if you look at EPA numbers last season, it's respectable because Kentucky doesn't give up explosive passes. But you can sure as shit paper cut them to death. And and sure enough, over 46 percent of passes grade successful against Kentucky. That was outside the top 100. I like Tyrell Jane at safety. He is the lone returning starter with a pulse. He is elite in coverage. Doesn't really like to support and run, though. Keydron Smith does transfer in from Ole Miss. He's been a solid player, but wasn't going to get consistent snaps this year for the Revels. Jalen Geiger has been serviceable, and Carrington Valentine is a serious liability in coverage. That's really your projected four. Past that, eh, right? Like Mark Stoops was looking for summer help in the transfer portal. It didn't really come back there. We saw in the spring game against Kentucky's first team offense, guys were running wide open everywhere, and it's not like Kentucky's receivers group doesn't come with its own set of questions. I listen, I'm not as high on Kentucky's defense as some of the forward facing projections that have them flirting with the top 15. Uh, the schedule of opposing offenses is just no walk in the park either. It's it's nice that you can avoid Bama and AM as a whole. But only Youngstown and Vandy are offenses where Kentucky's defense should be able to punch down, in my opinion. I know people will look and see the schedule of like Miami, Ohio and NIU, and certainly Kentucky will be three score favorites against both. But speaking strictly about those offenses, they're not pushovers, Todd. No, and I think this is a Kentucky team where I'll echo a lot of your same sentiments. People believe that they can be a legitimate dark horse in the SEC East, and quite frankly, I don't see it. Will Levis could go out there and put up magnificent numbers for this Kentucky offense, but defensively, they are a far cry uh, from where I think they need to be to compete with the upper echelon in this conference. I know a lot of people go back to last year and say, well, Kentucky gave Georgia one of its toughest challenges of the season. That's all relative. There is still a huge chasm between those two programs, and Kentucky exceeding their winter total, in my opinion, should be considered a major achievement uh, given the schedule that they'll face over the second half of the season. Who, who said that? I didn't think Kentucky's offense moved the ball until the final drive when... When you, look, over. when you look at some of the numbers that Will Levis came up with, I mean, there were people saying, well, he had the highest completion percentage of any quarterback all season against Georgia, and they thought that that was indicative of what they could do. But when you watch the final sequence of that game, I mean, it took, what, a 27-play march or so it felt like for them to sneak in the back door in a game that I actually thought was over. And turns out 37 minutes later, when I'm still flipping through, Kentucky's march for the cover ter- for cover Nirvana apparently still going on so I'm kind of with you they didn't do anything to wow me in that particular spot no they did not and we know what Georgia's defense was last season and you know Will Levis looked okay I guess in that game but if you remove that last drive which would qualify as garbage time it wasn't really the greatest performance that I'd ever seen and just kind of keeping things on pace here with Kentucky this season under eight and a half was the play by a lot of professionals this summer. That's why we're now down to this like 7.8 range. And candidly speaking, if the schedule wasn't as easy as it is relative to an SEC schedule, we wouldn't really be thinking of Kentucky making much noise, candidly. Garbage time drive, but meaningful to some pain. As we go from the east to the west, I want to remind all of you, our loyal listeners, to follow Pain on Twitter. That's at, well, I guess at Pain Insider, or are we just going by Pain now? I feel like I've been reading it the wrong way, so I want some clarification. It's it's at it's at Pain Insider. Same okay. thing. Okay. Just wanted Same to, thing. Just wanted just to check as far as display mechanisms. I had a conversation. I was on a, I was on a flight this summer. This is the story. I've been texting you. I don't really get much of a response, so I probably shouldn't share it here because it's not all that entertaining. I was on a plane this summer and uh, I sit next to Kanye West and he's like, you know, you should just shorten that. Just go with pain. And I said, you know what? You're, You're pretty brilliant. I probably should listen to that. And then I was watching the social network at the same time. And, uh, like drop the, the it's much cleaner. So that's what we've landed on. See, so there you go. So we've we've arrived, we've evolved, and we've made things cleaner and easier to discuss there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Todd Furman. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. <laughs> and before you get into some of the Western foes, if you haven't already done so at the top of the show, FanDuel.com. Use the promo code Bet the Board. Take advantage of your no sweat free bet. There are no limitations as far as what sports you can wager on. If you happen to lose that first wager, FanDuel will reimburse you with site credit, and you can be right back in the game from the east 
to the West, and it starts atop with the Alabama Crimson Tide, who see their win total at FanDuel Sportsbook 10.5. You do have to lay $2.80 just to make a buck coming back. Alabama finds themselves as odds-on favorite for the conference at minus $1.40. When you look at Alabama, armed with a bit of a throwback defense this season that resembles some of the great defenses of old that we've seen from the Crimson Tide. You have a Heisman Trophy winner quarterback, a high-profile transfer running back, and the best defensive player arguably in all of college football. Mind-numbing streak pain that I saw uh, comes courtesy of The Athletic. Alabama has been ranked in the top spot at some point in every season going all the way back to 2008. So that just shows their level of dominance. And when you try and wrap your head around that, it's obviously a credit to what Nick Saban has built down there in Tuscaloosa. But what was even more interesting were some of the quotes from Nick Saban this offseason saying this team has been really good. That's not the surprising part. But more along the lines of this team doesn't have any complaints Planers. Guys just do what they're coached to do. They work hard. We don't have a lot of negative guys on the team, and we have some real positive leadership, which I think is always important. And hopefully we can build on that, and there will be something that's an asset to this team. Awfully scary when a coach who's done nothing but one at a particular program has those things to say about his team. Alabama retains its offensive coordinator in Bill O'Brien. They retain their defensive coordinator in Pete Golding. And you can take it any which way, but I think we can start with Alabama's offense. Bryce Young will be the pivot, of course. He's just got to work with a slightly different receiving core, despite having a very talented transfer running back from Georgia Tech to hand off to. That's really the right vibe because, you know, reading some quotes, listening to interviews, seeing Nick Saban super calm at SEC Media Days this past week, his behavior this offseason is far too pleasant for me not to think Saban knows he has an absolutely ridiculous team. It's like walking into the boxing ring a $10 favorite. The, the demeanor is just a little different, and that is, that's the Saban vibe right now. Offensively, you mentioned Bryce Young being in year two of Bill O'Brien's version of the Alabama system, whatever that that is. I, for the first time in a few years, there really aren't, any surefire ready-made first-round pass catchers, but there are some nice options there. Jermaine Burton is solid, looking to break out 2.4 yards per route run for Georgia last season. Just felt like having a better quarterback at his disposal would help the draft stock, I guess. Tyrell Harrell is a legit track guy, 4-2 speed, average more than 29 yards a catch for Louisville. I like Cameron Latou at tight end more than most, and I think all the buzz this spring has been he's going to take the next step. You also have Ja'Cory Brooks, the number two receiver in the 2021 class from Miami. It looks like he has arrived, so we'll see what that looks like. Bama's offensive line was an issue last season. We kind of noted that before anybody. Even watching the Miami game, it looked like that could be a problem. It was. It didn't just, you know, didn't have their usual push in the run game they were outside the top 35 in line yards opportunity rate and stuff rate allowed Bryce Young was pressured on more than 36 percent of his dropbacks and his release was 2.7 seconds so it's not like he was back in the pocket just pounding the ball in his hands overall Bama was outside the top 100 in pressure rate allowed they also graded out the 10th best offensive line in the SEC they allowed nine more sacks than any Alabama team Nick Saban's coached so what does Nick Saban do brings in a brand new online coach players have taken to eric wolford is is what i am hearing the tackle spots are the question but it's not like there's no talent there right it's just nothing but projected starters that are four and five star guys you do have four star vandy transfer tyler steen and jc latham the number one tackle from the 2021 class those look like the tackles there's plenty of four and five star options behind those two as well probably you know a battle in camp for a couple positions just to round out that group but I just don't really think there's serious questions this season I think that group is going to improve drastically and I think part of that happens because of one man and that that man's Jameer Gibbs I think he's going to burst onto the scene in a big big way transferred in from Georgia Tech in the middle of December I was told he practiced with Bama leading up to the national championship game and the word was Gibbs was the best player on the field during those practices by a long mile Now, I look at Gibbs, and not only is he an elite running back, but he graded out the best pass catching back in the entire country, averaged more than three yards per route run. Fully expect running back passes for Alabama this season because Gibbs is not only electric out of the backfield, 
But if opposing teams want to recklessly send guys up the field to attack what's believed to be Bama's weak point, their offensive line, you're going to see the screen game to Gibbs more often to kind of keep defenses honest in my mind. The other element here is Bryce Young, we know, was Houdini last year. Not with just how effective he was throwing under pressure, but think about this. Alabama was a fringe top 80 offense on early downs. That poor early down offense led to an average of 6.8 yards to go on third down for Bama. That distance was outside the top 90 in the country. But Bryce Young was such a magician that somehow, even with an average of 6.8 yards to go on third down, Alabama was actually top five in late down success rate. I think Jameer Gibbs and his ability to be more efficient than what Bama had in the backfield last year fixes some of those early down woes. And when you're better on early downs and you're not as predictable on late downs, That's also going to help a Bama O-line. There is also a real positive to Alabama's schedule with how it sets up. They're going to have a month to get their offense tuned up, build some cohesion with the O-line, let Bryce get acclimated to his new weapons. First four games, the average projected defensive efficiency rank is 98th. But after that first month is crucial for some progression because from that point forward, Alabama only plays one defense projected outside our top 45 but I do think this is a unit that has a little bit more of an ability to be multiple yes some of the premium high-end receiver talent does leave but they have some nice guys that can fill some voids there I think Bryce Young is only going to excel because of the situations he's put in and Jameer Gibbs I think you're looking at the potential to be an outside dark horse for a Heisman I really think he's that good I mean, the kid has talent. We saw flashes of it behind a Georgia Tech offensive line and offense in general that lacked playmakers. And even when teams had one player they had a key on, Gibbs was the difference maker that you could see for anybody that subjected themselves to Yellow Jackets football over the last couple of seasons. Now, when you look at Alabama defensively, a lot more optimism about this group than there even was going into last year, a vintage defense, many are calling it. And when you hear what Will Anderson has to say, I mean, he was flat out honest. He says, we th- I think we are capable of being better than we were last year. I think starting toward the end, we believed we gelled a little bit more. I think that's one of the biggest things. Just keep gelling, keep working together. Everybody plays together. Everybody plays faster and physical. We know about Will Anderson as a headliner. We've Speaking of Heisman odds, we've seen his price absolutely plummet. I'm not quite sure who's making a strong case for a defensive player, even in this day and age, at 20 to 1 as somehow being a good bet, but that's a different discussion for a different day. Dallas Turner, one of the names to know along this defensive line, expected to be a massive difference maker. Trying to figure out how to get Chris Braswell out there as well in pass rush situations uh, with some of the players they have. And when, of course, when you look at Anderson's numbers, I mean, 34 and a half tackles for loss, 17 and a half sacks a season ago, projected by many to be the number one pick in the draft. Henry Tuotuo returns to anchor the linebacking core after he had 100-plus tackles a season ago. Jalen Moody and Deontay Lawson more than capable of being running mates uh, with Christian Harris going to the NFL. But Payne, I mean, this is Alabama and what we've grown accustomed to with Alabama. It's rinse and repeat with a lot of the athletes they can put out there in space and make life absolutely miserable for opposing quarterbacks. Roughly 70% of Alabama's defensive production returns. A lot of that production is from Will Anderson and Jordan Battle, probably the best D-line secondary duo in the country. And you mentioned some of those numbers from Will Anderson. Ridiculous. He also recorded a pressure or a stop on nearly 16% of snaps. 52 negative plays created. Jordan Battle is a safety with the ability to come up and run support and smack the piss out of you one snap and then play perfect blanket coverage 30 yards down the field the next snap. It's it's tough to fathom those two playing any better than they did last season, though. So, yes, they are elite. I, I don't want to say regression is going to happen, but I mean, some of those numbers were just absolutely ridiculous. Most of that returning production was because of Will Anderson. Alabama was number two in pressure rate created and finished third in EPA allowed among power five defenses. I don't think Alabama is going to have issues getting pressure. And you mentioned some of the other guys past Will Anderson and Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell. Bam also has a a new breed of incoming pass rushers uh, with the top two edge defenders in the 2022 class with Jeremiah Alexander and Jaheed Campbell. So that was an interesting combination to land as well. Publicly, some are wondering if Alabama has depth concerns at corner. 
I, you know, I fully understand they're coming off a season where where corner play wasn't elite and not to the Bama standard. They barely finished inside the top 30 in EPA per pass allowed. But for me, when I look at the names, when I look at the production, when I look at some of the metrics, you know, Kool-Aid is going to be a guy that I think is elite. Eli Ricks, Kyrie Jackson, and then Brian Branch, that's a very talented and productive four. Kool-Aid started halfway through his freshman season, right? True freshman year, he was out there. Only a 51% completion rate when targeted at 180 pounds. He was also fantastic against the run. So it's really an interesting player there. Eli Ricks, his true freshman season at LSU, graded out the best power five corner in man coverage. Brian Branch played over 600 snaps and graded out one of Alabama's best defenders last season. Kyrie Jackson was a freshman last year and started in the national championship game. So to me, you have four solid corner options. I'm not really sure where some of the, you know, public facing concern at corner is, but, you know, who knows if I had to nitpick or you forced me to pinpoint an area of the defense that could have problems relative to not being an elite defense. Maybe it's up the middle again. I mean, I I know Byron Young and DJ Dale return. Young was fantastic against the run last season, but both guys are under 300 pounds. They're both stepping into larger roles, and they're going to take on more snaps. There's not a ton of proven depth behind them. Tim Smith is okay. Maybe at some point later in the year you have a true freshman like Jaheim Otis who gets reps simply because he's a different body type at 6'4", 360. But my slight worry is probably the size and quality depth right up the middle, especially knowing Henry Toa Toa is your middle linebacker at 220 pounds. And listen, Nick Saban's going to forget more defense than I will ever know. But Toa Toa hasn't had one positively graded season ever. And not one aspect of his game is graded out positively at the end of a season ever, whether it's run defense, tackling, pressure, and in coverage. The other area that needs some positive regression is situationally. Alabama allowed a shade below four points per trip inside their 40. That was barely inside the top 60 in the country. There's also three projected top 25 offenses on Bama's schedule, and all three are on the road. So, yes, their defense is going to be damn good. I just wonder if Battle and Anderson can produce at a historic type level again and then I do wonder about the interior of the defense with you know some guys that are a little bit lighter getting moved into a little bit larger of a role and then if Henry Toa Toa can kind of hold things together in the middle with his slight frame and you know we've seen him he's tough he plays with injury but he's not like the greatest player so that would be my my lone concern for Bama's defense rightful favorites uh to win the national championship ahead of Ohio State and Georgia in your estimation yeah, and there was one book out west made, I think, a little bit of an error in their national championship price, and that got smacked accordingly. They this one I won't mention, but one book opened them plus three twenty five to win the national championship, and now all the sharp shops are dealing about plus a dollar ninety five. Yeah, numbers come down considerably over the last couple of months. So when you look at Alabama, it's national championship or bust and a rare rare year for the Crimson Tide to play with a chip on their shoulder coming up short in the national title game last year against the Georgia Bulldogs. If Alabama is going to be knocked from its perch in the SEC West, a logical team to potentially replace them, if it's not this year, maybe in coming years, would be the squad hailing from College Station. And that, of course, is the Texas A&M Aggies, whose win total is eight and a half. You do need to lay a dollar seventy-five to go over at FanDuel Sportsbook. They find themselves listed at 18-1 to to be SEC champions. And when you look at the arrows, all of them are trending up in College Station. Beat Alabama last year, flirted with playoff inclusion, a top recruiting class, four top eight classes in the last four cycles for Jimbo Fisher and companies. And I think when you're looking at the ceiling for this team, 2022 may be a year premature, but the roster has just 11 seniors on it as of now. The future clearly bright for what could go on at Kyle Field in the years to come. You know, listen, it's it's time for Jimbo's offense to kind of pick up the slack here and, and start being a little bit more consistent. And you look at the production through four seasons at A&M, Jimbo's had two offenses finish top 10 in schedule adjusted efficiency and two offenses finish outside the top 30. He continues to run a complex pro style scheme that operates at a snail's pace. So there's nothing overly innovative here. It feels like a really important year for AM and Jimbo. I, I mean, he's coming off the number one recruiting class. It's a historic type recruiting class. So he continues to win that section of, of college football. But now you just need to get over the hump. Everything I am hearing 
is Max Johnson will be the man under center. Haynes King didn't have a great spring and was absolutely horrific in the spring game. Max Johnson proved he was a threat with his legs as soon as he stepped on campus. And if that's the case, he's the far superior thrower. What stands out to me about Max Johnson, when he was kept clean, nearly an 80% adjusted accuracy rate at LSU, but LSU's offensive line was horrific in pass protection. The receiver group was banged up and lost its best in Boutte early in the season. So not the fairest way to gauge Max Johnson with those two elements in my mind. Now, don't get me wrong. Like Max has some things to clean up. And as a lefty, he struggles to throw left, which is a little bizarre to me. He is much better planting, driving, and throwing down the middle and to the right, whether it's intermediate or deep. Max was also fantastic using play action. 123 passer rating, that was fringe top 15 mark among qualifying quarterbacks from a pro-style system. I would think Jimbo implements that a little bit more for him. Uh, Again, like Max Johnson really hasn't proven to be great, but he is certainly an upgrade over what Jimbo had to work with last season. A&M was horrific through the air. They lacked an ability to push the ball downfield. That's why there was such a dichotomy in passing success rate versus EPA per pass. The offense had zero pop. I think we're going to see more downfield passing from A&M. Situationally, Jimbo's offense struggled. They had trouble converting quality possessions into points and finishing drives in the green zone. Couldn't stay on the field on late downs either. So some things that need to be fixed a little bit situationally. Past that, Evan Stewart has been all the rave. He has a chance to to break the Jimbo mold, and that is that Jimbo has had a tough time developing highly rated receiver prospects. Stewart could finally be that guy that fixes that poor reputation of receiver development. The true freshman has been running with the first team since practice one. Yul Keith Brown had a huge spring. He's going to take over the slot role. Anaya Smith just got popped Wednesday morning for a DWI. Um had a weapon and a few ounces of weed. We'll see how that plays out. I know he was going to be used more as a gadget guy this season. And then you're hoping Chase Lane and Jalen Preston provide experience depth, but really neither have proven to be very good. Up front, Jimbo is going to be searching for the right combination. Plenty of talent, but that talent has to start producing. So he brought in a new voice in Steve Adazio. We know Adazio has been a failed head coach, but his calling card has been coaching offensive lines. And I think that's probably the role best suited for him. And I think he's fine in that role. A&M's O-line had over 21% of runs stuffed last season. Didn't create a ton of push, barely inside the top 70 in line yards. So I think a new voice is welcome there. I like the running back situation. Devin Achne is a home run threat anytime he touches it. He has true track speed, more than four yards a rush after contact last season. 21% of his runs were explosive. He can't handle a full load, though. But I think having Amari Daniels emerge this spring provides A&M with a very nice one-two punch. And they are loving everything they've seen from Amari Daniels. It was pretty damn good in the spring game as well. I think we're projecting A&M's offense to finish better than last season. That's unquestionable. And if Max Johnson gets better acclimated to Jimbo's system and Evan Stewart is the real deal and the O-line comes together, things could get real interesting. And there's enough talent to make you believe those things will kind of mold together. The schedule of defense is a tough, though. Only three defenses on the schedule projected outside our top 40. The other nine have a projected average defensive efficiency rank of 24th. It is an absolute gauntlet for Jimbo's offense this season. Hey, they have their work cut out for them, and we know that, obviously, Fans in College Station and Texas A&M believers across the country are extremely optimistic, not about what this just what this season can entail, but where this program is headed. Eventually, you have to realize some of those results on the field. Beating Alabama last year was a big start. We'll see how they can follow it up this year within the dynamics of that conference. Now, defensively, Texas A&M brings in a new voice there as well. DJ Durkin makes the trip from Oxford, Mississippi into College Station. The Aggies were fifth in stop rate a season ago, preventing opponents from scoring on 78% of their drives. Texas A&M ranked sixth in yards allowed per play at a meager 4.6, but it was the worst rush defense yards per game allowed since 2017. When you look at their defensive line pain, every 2021 starter either graduated or declared for the NFL draft. It's a big reason why Jimbo Fisher and his staff focus so heavily on that position as part of the 2022 recruiting class, signing eight defensive linemen there is a ton of very very highly touted prospects up and down this defense. What are some of the expectations for what you believe the Aggies can produce on this side of the ball? 
It's a good question. I would say nervous optimism is the right describing word for AM's defense. It's hard to match the talent on this side of the ball. And based on our starting projections, every single starter is four star or better. The average recruiting rank of the 11 starters is a 91. So on average, every player is a top 100 kid on this defense. You mentioned DJ Durkin coming over from Old Miss. Regardless of, of what you think about him as a human after being fired as a head coach, his last three college stops, Michigan, Maryland, and Ole Miss, those three defenses finished better in schedule adjusted efficiency in Durkin's final season at those schools than the year prior to his arrival. So he has shown an ability to improve a defense. For AM, there's two questions for me. Can the young defensive talent be fundamental and stay disciplined? It looks like the top eight along the defensive line are underclassmen. They're either freshmen, redshirt freshmen, or sophomores, uh, oozing with talent and ability. But lots of blown assignments in the spring game. You have to be gap sound. You have to be willing to set an edge. You can't get caught out of position. Can't have wandering eyes. And even with 30 mile per hour wins and a and without its starting center and running back and rotating four quarterbacks for the spring game, a ms defense gave up some gashers because the D-line was out of position or weren't assignment sound. And so we'll see what that looks like when they're playing other teams. You obviously have summer and the fall to clean that up a little bit. Will we see a drop off in pressure? I mean, you had Clemens, Johnson, and, and Leal combined to have an 11% pressure rate on pass rush snaps as a whole. AM was top 15 in pressure rate among Power 5 defenses. So the young guys are going to really have to step up here. Linebacker depth is the other question. Past the starting two with Edron Cooper and Andre White, who's next in line? Aaron Hansford was damn good against the run, had 54 stops last season and played well enough in coverage, so I think he's a little bit of a loss. The one area of the defense that should improve without question is a and secondary. Absolutely loaded with premium talent and depth. Antonio Johnson has the ability to play free safety. He also can man the slot. When you look at some of his numbers, 0.6 yards per slot coverage snap allowed last year. Damani Richardson has produced well back-to-back seasons. You have Jalen Jones, who's a top 25 recruit in the 2020 class. He is penciled in to start at corner. You also have a surprise in Tyreek Chappell, who was thrown into the fire last season and produced better numbers than anyone could have expected. Let's see if, if Durkin goes with the star rating there or the better production in that camp battle. Denver Harris looks to have made a year two leap during spring. There is just a lot of guys to pick from with both talent and production in AM secondary. So, I mean, that that unit is just, wow, loaded, loaded, loaded. With all that talent, though, when you look at it in the secondary, it's really hard to get better than last season, right? Like AM was top five in EPA per pass. Only 33% of passes grade successful. They were also a really good situational defense. Top 10 in early down EPA allowed. Number one in points allowed per quality possession. They stopped the run in key moments. When you put things in that context, it is really hard to call for improvement metrically. And a and will have to face six top 30 offenses by our numbers as well. So really what this comes down to is we saw this win total open eight and a half. It's basically state eight and a half. Is Texas A&M more talented and better than an eight and a half win team absolutely but the (laughs) schedule is so difficult that it just seems like a gauntlet week after week and Jimbo over the years has shown you know to slip up a game or two so ultimately we'll see if that's the undoing I don't know if this schedule allows them to go to the college football playoff Yeah, middle portion of the schedule will do this team no favors. Yes, they start out with three games at home, but you're talking about the final game in that trio being against Miami, where A&M will be more than a touchdown favorite. And then you play four straight games away from home, a bye week sandwiched in there, but you're talking about Arkansas and Arlington, you're at Mississippi State, at Alabama, a bye week, and then at South Carolina, but for things lighten up down the stretch. So you better be able to hold serve there. Otherwise, this season can get away from you in a hurry. And like you said, you can judge teams based on their merits and their overall all talent level and power rating, but that's not necessarily indicative of a schedule that can be difficult. And it's why this win total isn't any higher than it is. 
As far as A&M being a legitimate threat to Alabama, I think this is where you start to see a little bit of a drop down for where these teams are in the SEC West pecking order. And we'll go to the Ole Miss Rebels, who see their win total sitting at seven and a half. You do need to lay a dollar sixty-five at FanDuel Sportsbook to go over that total. Fifty to one long shots to win the SEC. And uh, this offseason, Lane Kiffin, self-proclaimed portal king, probably finished right alongside Lincoln Riley or next to him, depending on how you grade the transfer classes, but it's a very young coaching staff. When you go up and down the ages of the assistants that Kiffin has brought in Oxford, his star quarterback, Matt Corral, his top pass rusher in Sam Williams, and nearly 20 other major contributors have moved on. We talked about losing your offensive coordinator, Jeff Lebby, when we broke down Oklahoma. We talked about DJ Durkin moving to College Station in the Texas A&M preview a few moments ago. New players, new systems, new coaches, new culture. Charlie Weiss Jr. in to inherit the reins for an Ole Miss offense pain that ran the football a lot more than people would be led to believe. And the folks that I've spoken to really don't think it's going to be Jackson Dart getting the start under center when Ole Miss plays its first meaningful football game, that they think Luke Altmaier a lot closer to seizing that opportunity and responsibility as QB1 wearing powder blue. What's going on with that, by the way? There seems to be this uh, migrating of, of betters and now coaches likening themselves to chess pieces. What's going on with that? I have no I have no idea. I mean, there's more princesses, princes, queens, and kings in the sports gambling space than I've ever dreamed of in my wildest dreams. And now you're seeing that in college football as well. So apparently everybody wants to be the member of the royal family in some capacity or another, even if it's all self-anointed. <laughs> Uh, schematically, not much is going to change offensively with Lebby leaving for Oklahoma. It is still Lane Kiffin's offense. Ole Miss is still going to run an RPO-based system with play-action deep shots and his own running scheme, and it's just very quarterback-friendly. And who that quarterback is, I don't think has necessarily been decided. It'll take most of fall camp to figure it out. Everything that I had heard from spring camp, unfolded the exact way in the spring game. And the three things were Luke Altmaier isn't very accurate. Jackson Dart doesn't have a grasp of the offense. And whoever wins the battle, neither are going to replicate Matt Corral's efficiency this season. That was basically all in all a ring endorsement for exactly what this offense is going to look like in 2022. (laughs) That that was what I was told. I watched the spring game every second of it. I was like, boy, That is damn sure accurate. Um, Looking at the recruiting pedigree, the small sample of performances last season, some accuracy metrics, some running ability stuff, it does feel like Jackson Dart would have a leg up on Luke Altmaier once he's had a couple more months in the playbook during spring break. We'll see. I really think this is an open battle. What seems clear to me, though, is the strength of the Rebels offense will be their own line and running backs. O-line returns four starters from a group that was top 25 in opportunity rate and helped a run game that finished top 25 in EPA per rush. Lane snagged a four-star tackle transfer Mason Brooks from Western Kentucky, who's produced three straight plus seasons. On paper, lots of running back production is gone, but the talent takes an uptick with Zach Evans and Ulysses Bentley. That, to me, is a really dynamic duo of running and catching running backs. You know, you look at Zach Evans, average seven yards a carry, nearly four and a half yards of them after contact. Almost 19% of Zach Evans' runs were explosive, and his elusive rating was off the charts. He is a five star running back talent. If everything between the years continues to mature, he's going to be scary. Receiver group is interesting because the contributing talent this season won't match last season with Dontario Drummond, but availability is always the best ability. And Ole Miss dealt with some injuries to the receiver group. You do have Mingo, Jackson, and Watkins, who are all upperclassmen. Mingo and Jackson need to be a little bit more sure-handed. Both had a drop rate approaching 15% last season. The tight end transfer from USC, Michael Trigg, has been all the hype. He's 6'5", 250 with speed. You can see his ability, and there are specific plays designed for him that we saw in spring, whether it's in the red zone but he is going to be a a decent part of this offense schedule wise I think there's time for for Lane Kiffin to figure out his best option under center and implement all the the new parts you have Troy in Kentucky um certainly you know not 
pushovers defensively. But when you factor in Arkansas, Georgia Tech, Tulsa, and Vandy, it's a defensive schedule the first six weeks that has an average projected efficiency rank outside the top 100. But that's the vital cutoff date. Lane has to get the offense humming by October 15th because the final six games, the defenses have a projected efficiency rank of 18th. So there is time, but you need to get it figured out by October 15th. <laughs> that's it's always interesting to try and put nice time parameters in there to figure out exactly where old Miss can be. I mean, this program been interesting. I mean, we saw flashes of Altmaier. He clearly was in over his head in the bowl game against Baylor. We'll see how that quarterback battle continues to unfold uh, as you figure out exactly what this pecking order looks like. Defensively for Ole Miss, I mean, this team was markedly better uh, a season ago. They play a unique 3-2-6 scheme, if we want to call it that. And you're talking about a group that was allowing a horrendous 38 plus points per game in 2020 to a respectable 24 and a half points per game in 21. It marked the SEC's biggest year over year jump since 2004. And they've lacked some consistency in production on the interior of the line, but they do have some experience from a linebacking standpoint. You bring in a transfer in Troy Brown from Central Michigan, where much is expected. But I guess when you're talking about playing a bend but don't break defense, you hope that there's some strength and some difference makers as far as putting six DB on the field all at once you know, we called for improvement from old Miss's defense last season said if they could go from 120th to 80th and EPA per play allowed that would be a nice sleep Ole Miss finished 77th not a bad projection there in terms of schedule adjusted efficiency the Rebels made an even larger stride going from 80th to a fringe top 35 defense this spring, it feels like Chris Patridge upped the aggression, something we could see more of this fall with blitzes and stunts. I know Ole Miss added some bodies along the D-line from the transfer portal, and the way they've recruited the last couple seasons has helped some depth. Sam Williams, though, he's going to be missed, right? Like registered a 14% pressure rate on pass rush snaps. Had a win rate in the high teens. Jared Ivey is going to be that replacement. He transfers in from Georgia Tech. Certainly better setting the edge than San Williams, but just an 8% pressure rate on pass rush snaps. Cedric Johnson can hopefully fill the pressure role as well, but he's a one-trick pony. If if Cedric Johnson isn't getting to the quarterback, he is a liability elsewhere. Katie Hills penciled in as the starting nose tackle. Yeah, he's been an absolute zero looking at the numbers, right? He's a run-stopping nose that can't stop the run. TCU transfer Kari Coleman comes in. He's actually graded out pretty well. He's a guy that has to be dependable, and I want to see the Taiwan Malone experience. He is a four-star interior lineman from the 2021 class. He is going to be needed. Troy Brown comes over from Central Michigan to fill the void at linebacker. He has been an all-MAC defensive team guy three years in a row. Uh, really intriguing player that's been one of the best cover linebackers in college football while also holding up pretty well against the run. Hopefully the transition from the MAC to the SEC West isn't too much to handle. You, you look at Brown, he's a little bit smaller and he's had trouble tackling at the MAC level. So let's see how his game translates there. That's okay. Nobody tackles in the MAC. So you can understand <laughs> why, why Troy Brown didn't tackle in that league. He just wanted to be on par with all of his compatriots. <laughs> <laughs> the the front seven for Ole Miss is really, I think, the key to making another leap defensively. And, and Kiffin claims it's his deepest D-line he's ever had. You just wonder if a horse like Sam Williams emerges. Now, you mentioned that three two six Ole Miss plays. So by nature, it's not going to be the most stout front. And you see that dichotomy in the metrics, right? It's, it's top 25 in EPA per pass allowed, but outside the top 120 against the rush struggle on early downs but fantastic on late downs and these defenses are built to stop the new age passing offenses when you're playing though against these teams that recruit ridiculous offensive linemen and ridiculous running backs from the south sometimes it's difficult to just be like matadors up front so that's that's the lone question here the Ole Miss secondary should be the strength again 12 guys returning three more transferring in that starts with DeAndre Prince, graded out the best Rebels defender last season, allowed a 74 passer rating when targeted, only one touchdown surrendered. Among cornerbacks with at least 300 coverage snaps, Prince graded out in the 90th percentile. Miles Battle is solid. A.J. Finley is one of the better SEC safeties. Ashim Young transfers in from Iowa State. We talked about how that was a big loss for the Cyclones on our Big 12 preview. The lone question I would say in the back half is corner at uh, a depth at corner. So let's see how that shakes out. I think a real positive, though, defensively for Old Miss. 
is again looking at their schedule. Outside of Alabama, there isn't an offense on the schedule we project inside our top 25. Certainly some, you know, top 40 type offenses with Kentucky and A&M and Arkansas and Mississippi State, possibly LSU. But one offense where Ole Miss is going to truly be outclassed on the entire schedule. Hey, it's a credit to what Lane Kiffin has done to try and maintain some consistency here. We know how tough it is to compete year in, year out in the SEC West, and we'll see if they're able to raise the overall recruiting profile and bring in some bigger bodies to allow them to be a little bit more physical in the trenches, but... When you look at that schedule, to your point, you try and figure things out. They'll have four. Uh, I'm not going to call them preseason games because you may have to work a little bit against Georgia Tech and Tulsa. But for all intents and purposes, Ole Miss's season doesn't really start until October 1st when they get a home game against Kentucky, a team that we know wants to try and run the ball down your throat. And it'll be a very interesting team to watch from start to finish. From Oxford, Mississippi, Payne, we head to Fayetteville, Arkansas to talk a little Razorbacks football, and their win total sits at 7.5. You do need to lay $1.70, though, if you want to go under the total at FanDuel Sportsbook. 60-1 to shots to win the SEC. And when you look at this team, I mean, there's so much to be made about what Sam Pittman has done to try and take this team and program in general from the doldrums and restore them to a level of respectability. They went 4-20 and the two seasons before he arrived on campus, and he talked a little bit about how last season was most fulfilling to see the fans. The passion for Arkansas has always been there, he said. It's just at times, don't give them enough reason to be passionate, if that makes sense. And there's... a Fat, passionate fan base who truly believes in their starting quarterback in KJ Jefferson. They did lose three out of four games last year when they scored 35 plus. So it wasn't the offense that let them down. Jefferson on the surface, the fourth rated passer in the conference, a 67% completion percentage, 2,600 yards passing, 21 touchdowns, with only four picks. And he led the team with 664 yards on 146 carries. And while he has created a ton of optimism pain for what Kendall Bryles wants to do offensively, I've watched K.J. Jefferson enough to believe that he ain't the fourth best quarterback in the conference last year, and I don't think he's going to be rated nearly that high this year. So Sam Pittman, whether intentional or not, hired the perfect offensive coordinator. Now, obviously, he intended to hire Kendall Bryles, who we all knew was damn good. Follow where I'm going here for a minute. Kendall Bryles should be a G5 head coach by now. But his last name is hindering that ability. Nobody feels comfortable yet, yet, making Kendall Bryles a lead man with how his dad left Baylor and the stench is kind of still in the air. And that in return has made the hire fantastic for Sam Pittman and it's provided continuity to Arkansas's offense. He's been there three seasons. He has turned K.J. Jefferson into a guy that was big and athletic. And now all of a sudden he's a really, you know, he's he's a real starting quarterback. He's done some things to accentuate KJ Jefferson's best attributes and hide things KJ will never be able to do as a quarterback. And I think that's ultimately how we should probably gauge KJ Jefferson. That's fair. I'll give you that much. That's fair. Yeah. There's, there's some limitations there, but Bryles just does a really, really good job hiding them. Now, when you step up in a class, some of them become a little more evident, but the first thing you're going to see with a Kendall Bryles offense is the receivers line up super wide. And sometimes it feels like they're almost out of bounds. And that is designed to create more space and make defenses cover more ground. And then Arkansas really has the extra man advantage in the box with a mobile quarterback. And you add that element with an O-line group that returns four starters from a unit that was top 30 in line yards, top 20 in opportunity rate. And you see how Arkansas stays ahead of the chains. That design and efficient ground game led Arkansas to being a top 35 offense in early down EPA top 15 and bypassing third down on first and second down and then when Arkansas goes to pass Kendall Bryle makes it super easy on KJ Jefferson right you look at some of the throw types more than 49 percent of his throws are with play action or an RPO element the throws are one read outside so KJ doesn't have to go through progressions or worry about throwing the traffic once the ground game gets going and defenses have to cheat then Bryles lets KJ take these one-on-one deep shots that are one read so Kendall Bryles is basically set up a paint by numbers offense for KJ Jefferson and and listen like it's not to diminish him He has really come a long way. I didn't even think he would be this good, but that's how good Bryles is. And I think you look at K.J. Jefferson, he has certainly made some strides himself personally as a quarterback. He is coming off his best season ever. 
he has improved um, with his accuracy, 77% adjusted accuracy rate. But again, there's some reasons for that because he's not really tasked with being, you know, asked to throw with, you know, difficulty. He had more than a two to one touchdown pass to turnover worthy rate, uh, throw rate. Those are all great things, but you can really tell how good a quarterback is when he's asked to pass when the opposing teams know it's pass. And Arkansas in that regard was top 80 in success rate on passing downs, barely inside the top 100 in late down success rate. When Bryle's system kept them ahead of the chains, it was an offense that operated at a fringe top 30 rate on standard downs. So just a huge difference and how the offense needs to operate for KJ Jefferson to be most effective. And sure, there will be people, specifically Arkansas fans, that come at us and be like, oh, all quarterbacks aren't great in known passing situations. You're correct, but the dichotomy is drastically different. Why this is important to stay ahead of the downs is Arkansas has to replace three of its top four pass catchers, one of which is Traylon Burks, who was the 18th pick in the draft, averaged 3.6 yards per route run, was the number one wide receiver in the draft in terms of yards per route run against outside press man coverage. He was a cheat code. It allowed K.J. Jefferson to just toss it up. If Arkansas can't find adequate receiver play and someone to con, you know, just stretch the field on a consistent basis – Even with four returning alignment, defenses are going to be able to cheat and clog the box. And if the run game isn't as effective, the drop-off is large, again, when K.J. Jefferson has to operate in these known passing situations. So I'm looking at Arkansas's receivers. They went out. They grabbed the former five-star Oklahoma transfer in Jordan Hazelwood. Maybe he's that guy. I I mean, he's regressed every season. And last year, he averaged 1.2 yards per route run in a wide-open Lincoln-Riley offense. Warren Thompson looks elite getting off the bus, but couldn't start for a receiver deprived FSU offense. This is a problem area and Arkansas knows it. And it's why backup quarterback Malik Hornsby is going to get snaps at wide receiver this season. I think we see regression from Arkansas's offense. The average projected defensive efficiency rank of the 12 defenses Arkansas faces this season, 36th. And that's with Missouri State and Liberty factored in, Todd. And I think Arkansas is going to get tested right out of the gates, too. I know their home games, and while Cincinnati loses a lot, Luke Fickle's team going to bring their lunch pail. We'll get a pretty good indication of exactly where those two teams are. And Arkansas follows it up with their SEC opener against South Carolina the following week. To your point, Payne, when you talk about how good Arkansas was running the football, if you include K.J. Jefferson, as you should, the team had four 500-yard rushers for the first time since 1975, and they led the SEC in rushing at more than 227 yards per game for the first time since it had the holy trinity of college running backs in Darren McFadden, Felix Jones, and the great white hype in Peyton Hillis back in 2007. When you look at this team defensively, Barry Odom, one of the best when it comes to coordinating on this side of the ball. And the defense, which ranked fifth in the SEC in yards per play and sixth in scoring, has to replace a majority of its production. Need to replace a top defensive tackle, top defensive end, a pair of consistent guys at linebacker. The pass rush was slow, third slowest in the nation, and pressure rate barely inside the top 100. And I think there could be some legitimate growing pains for an Arkansas defense that showed vulnerability for stretches last year, but overall was a slightly above average unit. Barry Odom has proven to be a fantastic hire as well. Doesn't get enough credit for what his defenses can do. And most of the time it's been with lesser talent. Now, Arkansas, barely inside the top 100 in returning defensive production, as you mentioned. You lose some veterans, uh, but it really doesn't feel like a defense losing eight starters. Just based upon the players that I see and what their production level was at prior stops or what it was in shortened roles that will now expand. D-line has question marks specifically with the depth on the interior. Tareen Carter tore his knee late in spring and left Arkansas with only three scholarship defensive tackles. After spring, they signed a body and transferred Terry Hampton from Arkansas State. Jordan Dominic transferred in from Georgia Tech to work on the edge. Had a nice season in 2020 with a a 13% pressure stop rate on all snaps. You do have Landon Jackson, a four-star, and from LSU who transfers in. So it, it feels like there's more talent, but we'll see what the production looks like as they all mesh into this new system. I like the linebacker room. You have Bumper, Drew Sanders, the former five-star Alabama linebacker. He was outstanding in spring. 
I think the real strength of Arkansas's defense is the secondary, and that's why there was more three two six used during spring ball. Lots of emphasis on Barry Odom being able to bring pressure from all directions with that scheme via the blitz, which was an area that he knew uh, needed some improvement. Now, in general, with that system, it's difficult to get pressure without blitzing, and we saw that last season. You mentioned it. Arkansas was bottom 15 among power five defenses and pressure rate. I look at some of the names back there in the, the secondary. Jalen Catalan has the talent to be a day two pick if he can regain his 2020 form. That would be massive. Uh, McLaughlin transfers in from LSU as a four-star kid. Was damn good in coverage last season. Latavius Brinney was a guy I felt should be playing more for Kirby Smart's Georgia defense. He was fantastic. He finally got 500 snaps last season. Was one of the best coverage safeties in all of college football. Look, I mean, Arkansas won nine games last season, gave Alabama a run for their money, lost at Ole Miss by one in the final play, and Sam Pittman's a really likable guy. It's a great story. But there's a reason the win total is six and a half. Arkansas is going to need the ball to bounce its way. It's going to need some injury luck. It has to find capable receivers. And if those things happen, there are some toss-up type games on the schedule to where you know they can run hot and variance ends up in their favor but you know six of the 12 games have a point spread in either direction of a field goal or less based on our projections Todd so this feels like a team with just a a ton of variance this season it's a team that we've kind of stayed out of the way of and really don't see a ton of value one way or the other but it just feels like this has the makings to be either you know, a really down season or one that might be a little bit higher than odds maker expectation. But again, it's going to take a lot of health. It's going to take a lot of injury luck. It's going to take, you know, just the ball kind of kind of going in their favor, which I'm not necessarily sure is going to happen. Yeah, life in the SEC is never easy, and it only gets more difficult when you're talking about two non-conference games against Cincinnati, one of the best group of five programs out there, and a road trip to Provo, something that most SEC teams aren't willing to do, heading into a bye week in the middle of October. So we can only hope from an aesthetic standpoint in football watching that we get an early snowstorm, something I'm sure Arkansas football fans (laughs) will not be in a hurry to watch when they have to go out to Utah in the thick of things in conference play last sharp money on Cincinnati in that opening game as well at all come in at seven and a half I know the market's pretty much in that seven range now I want to say opened eight and a half okay that makes sense then where it came in at more than a touchdown I think a lot of people are optimistic that Luke Fickle's team won't fall off nearly as much as uh, people are led to believe with a potential maybe even an upgrade at quarterback albeit down some experience with no Desmond Ritter on the roster one of Arkansas's biggest rivals in the SEC West though Going through a transition period in its own right, and that, of course, would be LSU. With Brian Kelly taking over for Ed Orgeron, the over-under for the Tigers this season, 6.5, minus $1.15 at FanDuel Sportsbook, should you like to go over. 100-1 to long shots to win the SEC. And when you're talking about LSU, they lost 74 starts a season ago due to injury, placed them 131st in all of college football. So injury luck, clearly not smiling upon them in any capacity. And Brian Kelly was open and honest, said he wasn't going to tolerate players who had issues with failed drug tests, academics, or punctuation. Seems to be par for the course for the way Ed Orgeron ran the program down there in Baton Rouge. And it's part of the reason that LSU has been a roller coaster of extreme highs and troubling lows for nearly two decades. Kelly entered the offseason with zero returning production at cornerback and an offensive line that had shown inconsistency for years, even predating Ed Orgeron's time in the sidelines. So... What do they do? They go to the pro portal to bring in some talent, and we'll get to some of those key contributors. But when you're looking at LSU offensively, it starts at the quarterback position. Miles Brennan returns from injury, a true pocket passer. The mercurial Jaden Daniels transfers in from Arizona State. The $100 million question, can a guy like that improve upon his accuracy and decision-making that was downright atrocious last season? There are some other options, but it appears that early enrollee Walker Howard, a five-star quarterback of the future, is is going to be redshirted, so Garrett Nussmeyer would be the other guy. But this is an LSU team, Payne, ranked 13 out of 14 in the SEC in total rushing yards and yards per rush. And that includes a game where they ran up 300 rushing yards against Florida. Awfully scary when you look at this LSU team, knowing the monster that they can become. But what are some realistic expectations for this team, especially offensively, in Brian Kelly's first trip to the South? Yeah, I mean, it's always tough gauging coaching when you have the best players in your own conference 
and Cincinnati had that in recent years, but it wasn't necessarily the case on the offensive side. So when I look at LSU's offense, it's going to come down to Denbrock mixing some things up. I I like him. I just want to see what it looks like. I know he didn't have the best weapons. They weren't outstanding by any stretch at Cincinnati. Some of the scheme stuff that he does, I do like. He runs a lot of RPO concepts. He likes spreading you out and attacking, which you know he did roughly 30% of the time last season at Cincy. He also has the ability to switch and play with heavy 12 and 13 personnel. Now, I think the latter is a question mark for LSU this season because they might have to go four wide more than Denbrock's accustomed to because there really isn't a, a tight end on the roster that's worthy of anything, let alone two. But there are, you know, a ton of receivers that LSU does have. Keyshawn Boutte should be healthy. Didn't do a ton in spring, but has the potential to be the second best receiver in the country. He's got speed. He's willing to go over the middle and play physical. Boutte has an ability to beat press coverage. If you look at Boutte's freshman and sophomore seasons, despite revolving doors at quarterback, whoever's thrown to Boutte, when teams press him on the outside, 135 passer rating for the quarterback throwing to him so he is a cheat code outside hopefully he stays healthy that'll give brian kelly and denbrock some you know a key cog to throw to and build the offensive round now if lsu's remade offensive line that lost four starters can create some push denbrock's probably going to stay balanced you look at his last season at Cincy, 50-50, run pass and non-garbage time situations, loves using pre-stamp motion. He's shown an ability and a willingness to throw on first down. And last season when Cincy threw on first down, almost 50% of the time was with play action. So we like all of these things from, from a Denbrock system that we saw at Cincinnati. There is a quarterback battle heading into spring. To this point, my understanding is Miles Brennan has the lead, but anything can happen during fall camp. As I mentioned, right, the O-line has question marks, especially at center. And I wonder if, you know, less turmoil helps some things. It's not like LSU was was great last season up front and the four guys they lose were first-round draft picks by any stretch. Uh, But the unit was outside the top 85 in line yards, opportunity rate, and sack rate allowed. Max Johnson was pressure on 35% of his dropbacks, and he only held on to the ball for 2.7 seconds. So it was a a bad O-line that probably will improve just based on being a little bit more buttoned up and caring a little bit more it looks like you have a true freshman in will campbell who enrolled early and was a top 40 player he's going to start day one at left tackle probably a breath of fresh air for for lsu faithful knowing their first five games last season had five different starting left tackles lsu won a recruiting battle for four-star transfer tackle miles frazier to fix the left tackle position but it appears he's going to kick inside now you have Traymond shorts transfers in as a high three-star interior lineman from east tennessee state he looks like a starter as well but again the projected starting center is charles turner he's played 200 snaps in three seasons of most of which were at tackle and they were not good snaps Your left tackle is a true freshman. Your two guards are moving up in class from FIU and East Tennessee to the SEC West, and there's zero depth if attrition hits. So that's kind of where you're at with the offensive line. I think the biggest dilemma for LSU's offense is the schedule is an absolute nightmare. Five defenses LSU plays we project inside our top 20. Another five defenses project in our top 45. Southern and New Mexico State are the only two defenses on the schedule where LSU gets to punch down a little bit. The other 10 defenses have a projected average efficiency rank of 24th. So this is a a welcome to the SEC Mike Denbrock kind of thing here. Wait, they don't get to punch down in their season opener? Crickets. 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 Stupidity doesn't elicit response. Stupidity is where I thrive, Payne. That is where I am in my own element. Um, for LSU's offense, you mentioned it, the receiving core, clearly one to watch. A, a lot of flash and dash there. We'll see which quarterback wins the job uh, and if this team can be a little bit more balanced. Now, defensively, Matt House comes in, who's got a little bit of pedigree in his own right, helped orchestrate the Kansas City Chiefs defense. At one point in his career, LSU pressured opposing quarterbacks on an SEC high 35% of dropbacks last season. It's actually the 14th highest rate in the FBS. Why was that so important? Because the Tigers secondary ranked 112th in the FBS and pass efficiency defense on dropbacks in which the quarterback was not pressured, allowing a rating of 161.4. 
Payne, from a defensive line standpoint, this LSU group looks like there is a lot of NFL caliber potential. Allie Gay was hurt last year, but he flashed and showed what he was capable of in limited snap count. B.J. Ojolari, another absolute beast up front. And when you're talking about ends with disruptive energy, then get home, they're going to have to, given some of the inexperience and unproven commodities in the secondary. So if we're looking at LSU defensively, what are some realistic parameters or guardrails we should be setting for what Coach House is going to be dealing with? I really like Matt House. He might not be a, a household name. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> but he is uh, well respected among football people. He was at Pittsburgh under Paul Christ, coaching the likes of Aaron Donald. Last three seasons, he was the linebackers coach for the Kansas City Chiefs, won a Super Bowl ring. Prior to his NFL stop, Matt House was Kentucky's defensive coordinator in 17 and 18 under Mike Stoops. And he inherited a Kentucky defense that was 93rd in schedule adjusted efficiency. After two seasons, Kentucky was 15th. So he has shown an ability to improve defenses. On paper, you hit it perfectly. The strength of LSU this season should be their defensive line. You have Ali Gay. You have B.J. Ojolari. They return after injury shortened seasons. Can they stay healthy? Right, That's something they necessarily haven't proven to do over time. On the inside, you have Jacqueline Roy graded out the best returning defender LSU has. Mason Smith was a five-star freshman in 2021, should progress there in year two. Brian Kelly also landed Makai Wingo, a four-star interior lineman from Missouri who played well as a true freshman. Now, it'll be tough to follow up last season's numbers with a 22% stuff rate and finishing seventh in pressure rate among Power 5 defenses, but there's a lot of talent along that D-line for Matt House. It looks like spring camp caused some shuffling at linebacker. Mike Jones and Greg Penn are the projected starters coming into fall camp, despite Micah Bakersville having a far superior season to both of them last season. Uh, In talent and namesake, LSU secondary loses a ton. Derek Stingley was the third pick in the NFL draft. Eli Ricks transfers to Alabama and was the best man cover corner in 2020. So if you're only dissecting teams from that viewpoint to help with projections... I feel like it's probably wrong. You know, we know Stingley and Ricks didn't want to be there. We know for two seasons, players hated their defensive coordinators and energy and effort was optimal. And that's why you have, you know, the third pick and Ricks leave. The projected increased production last season uh, wasn't very good, right? LSU was outside the top 90 in EPA per pass allowed. And then you had a passing success rate allowed that was outside the top 90 as well with those elite players. So effort and energy and care and being buttoned up really are key components of trying to play defense. I think you'll see a defense that cares and is a little bit more buttoned up. And so, you know, the names won't be as good, but I think the production does increase. You have Joe Voucha coming over from Arkansas. He's coming off a plus season. Um, You have Jarek Bernard Converse comes over from Oklahoma State. He graded out Jim Knowles, second best player in a secondary from a historically good Oklahoma State defense that finished top five in the country. Uh, Makai Garner, the Louisiana transfer, has been one of the most valuable corners the last two seasons. I'm not saying this is going to be an elite secondary year one, And again, there's not as much premium name talent, but effort and a better coordinator. They can yield improvement. And listen, injury luck will improve as well. LSU had the second worst injury luck last season. What I can say here is overall, you know, we bet LSU under seven and a half early this offseason. It's now six and a half. It's an absolute stay away at that price. I've even seen other sports books out west, Todd, your former stomping grounds using a six. at six, you know, if I was forced to bet the thing, I'd be going. I'd be going over. Where we got it at seven and a half, it was only one one thought there. It was only one mindset, and that was going under. Ultimately, you know, selling LSU at their peak off season price because of the lack of depth and the schedule made some sense for us. Makes a ton of sense. I mean, this is a team, honestly, that when you look at their schedule, you could see them come together, you know, somewhere during the middle of the campaign and maybe be an undervalued commodity on a week in, week out basis. Or there's a very real possibility that you don't get full buy in with a lot of fresh faces there. Clearly, Brian Kelly will have the resources and no academic hurdles to try and navigate around down there in Baton Rouge like he dealt with at Notre Dame. But at the same time, 
it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of expectations. And Irish fans had grown uh, restless with his inability to get over the hump. I think he'll find LSU fans not to be nearly as forgiving if this season has some bumps in the road and they don't see reason to get excited heading into the 2023 campaign where this is a team that'll be expected to compete for a division crown. Nine teams, pain broken down as extensively as we know how to do around these fine parts. The SEC, obviously, you save the best for last, top to bottom, when you're talking about parity in the league. Of course, there were a handful of other programs that we weren't able to hit on, but two others that I think are are worth highlighting, at least in a limited capacity. And we can start with what's going on in Starkville with Mississippi State at 120-1 to to win the conference. They're the most experienced returning team as far as the SEC is concerned. Will Rogers returns. Lowest percentage of deep throws of any quarterback in the SEC last year, but that's Mike Leach's offense. Completed 74% of his tosses for more than 4,700 yards and a 36-9 touchdown interception ratio. This is a team that doesn't lean on their running backs, but that will be a position of strength with Dylan Johnson and McAvious Marks both returning. Neither rushed for more than 500 yards a season ago. The receiver group will have some fresh faces, talking about replacing the likes of a guy in Mackay Polk at wide receiver, 100 catches and more than 1,000 yards. Uh, But Jaden Wally capable of doing that. He's been a two-time SEC All-Conference player and Austin Williams could potentially be leaned on a little bit more. I think the offensive line though, that's a real concern when you're talking about a departure and a first round draft pick in Charles Cross. Top 10 at that. Scott Lashley as well. You do get three starters back with 80 starts between them uh, and there are six offensive line guys that started at a point in the season last year. When you look at Mississippi State's offense, was there anything that stuck out to you? You don't want to spend a ton of time uh, on the Bulldogs and what their outlook looks like. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is a team that's top 10 in returning production. You have a quarterback in Will Rogers that's pinpoint accurate and finished only behind Bryce Young in total expected points added among SEC quarterbacks. We have Mississippi State starting three points higher in our power rating than where they finished last season. I think they have a chance to be point spread darlings for the simple fact that the schedule is so daunting, they won't win a ton of games, and their true value won't correctly reflect itself in the betting market. So I think we're going to have some opportunities on Mississippi State week to week. Yeah, and I can't disagree with any of that. When you look at Mississippi State's early season schedule, Memphis at Arizona at LSU, maybe not a ton right out of the gates, but when they get into the heart of SEC West play, if you think that the big boys are beating each other up, Mississippi State could be the team more than capable of pulling off one of those outright upsets. And when you look at this team defensively, I mean, the past defense underwhelmed last season. They were 11th in the SEC in overall efficiency, 13 plays of 40 plus yards allowed. A priority for Zach Arnett was trying to limit some of the big plays. You do get three of your top five linebackers returning headlined by Tyus Wheat. And when you're talking about a run defense, yeah, it was stout because people could throw on this Bulldog secondary. So it'll be very interesting to see what this group produces in Starkville. But to your point, I don't think season long outlook will do them any justice. Week to week though, there may be some opportunities to try and find a little bit of value. Now as far as Auburn, 150 to 1 to win the SEC. I mean, there may not have been a program pain that was mired in more offseason controversy. Uh, than what the Tigers had to go through. I mean, there was drama all over the place around campus with Coach Harsey and his personal life, a five-game losing streak to close out last season, and it was the first losing campaign that we'd seen down on the plane since 2012. The Tigers ranked 11th in the SEC in scoring and averaged only 17.8 points per game over their final five contests. We've seen transfers out. We've seen a group that's going to rely on the ground game more than anything else. Defensively, yes, they held teams to 21.8 points per game and 5.3 yards per play, but they have to replace a number of key contributors, most notably Roger McCreary at defensive back and linebacker Zacoby McLean. Group lost seven defensive linemen in the portal, brings back a couple of guys, but man, this thing looks like it's getting off the rails quickly. You even wonder, Payne, if Brian Harsing can keep his job after this fall. He's probably gone. A couple things I will say here. The woman that was in the center of this Brian Harson thing, fantastic took us. The second thing... <laughs> is Shocker, she was a were... college cheerleader. You're really going out on a limb there with that claim. <laughs> The second thing is we went under six and a half earlier this summer. It is a full-blown sell on Auburn. The problem is it's at five and a half now. There is a real ability for this to get off the rails pretty quickly here. They probably have the worst situation in the entire SEC with the quarterback 
dilemma they have going on there. Most of the boosters at this point are not fans of Brian Harson, so it'll be a quick trigger if they start pretty slow here. So there is an ability here for this just to get off the rails quite quickly. Another team that I think we should maybe just mention a little bit because there's a lot of buzz and I'll I'll start and you can kind of finish is is South Carolina. I think that's an interesting team just based upon the momentum they have right now. Shane Beamer, I think he's getting some things headed in the right direction. Players love him. He's winning on the recruiting trail relative to what the Gamecocks are. There wasn't a Power 5 program that upgraded the quarterback position from a point spread perspective more than South Carolina. And if being benched and forced to transfer acts as a little bit of a humbling mechanism for Spencer Rattler, then I think Shane Beamer is going to be cooking with some peanut oil here. If you look at Spencer Rattler, I he was unlikable. Uh, and so uh, that's partly why he lost his job. And then obviously Caleb Williams showed out a little bit and showed he could run the offense a little bit better being a dual threat. But there has not been a quarterback that's graded out better as a passer than Spencer Rattler since the 2020 season. So it was a home run hit there. They brought in some transfers. I think this is an interesting team moving forward. The win total is at six and a half because the schedule is, is difficult and they're probably not going to be there quite yet. But they're an interesting team that had a lot of noise this summer that was at least worth mentioning here in our uh, our quick hits. I mean, what's a realistic ceiling for a program like this in South Carolina? I mean, is it consistently being the second best team in the SEC East, knowing that Kirby Smart assigned essentially a lifetime extension at Georgia? Or do you feel that there are realistic expectations that this team wants to compete for division titles if Shane Beamer sticks along, sticks around long enough and they're willing to invest in the program? I don't know what that answer is in the current landscape of college football. I really think you can be happy being a nine-win team, but expectations could change with what the new landscape of college football could look like in two or three years, right? If the Pac-12 doesn't dissolve, if certain teams in the ACC cannot get out of their contracts, you're going to see a situation where both the Big Ten and the SEC are going to be making three times more than everyone else. And so suddenly these tier two, tier three SEC programs spending at a 3x rate of, say, a Clemson or a Florida State might start winning a few more recruiting battles. I think it goes a long way, obviously. If you can recruit your top-tier talent in your own state, something that South Carolina hasn't been able to do in the Palmetto State, given Clemson's recent surge, it obviously makes things a little bit more effective there. Just so tough in the SEC, and as they continue to add programs that they inevitably will, uh, you have to imagine some of these traditional second-tier uh, programs or third tier as the case may be with some of the schools in the SEC will have their hands full but definitely a team to watch and to your point we'll see if Spencer Rattler can get things figured out had a bit of a wake-up call still has all the tools to potentially project to being a very high pick in the National Football League if he gets it right between the ears all right we added three more teams to the nine deep dive so the only two teams that don't get a mention here Missouri and Vanderbilt despite Clark Lee believing that Vanderbilt will be one of the preeminent programs in all of college football I think I think Clark Lee may be focused more on the FCS than the FBS for that to happen at Vanderbilt, but different discussion for a different day. Follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod for all sorts of updates, especially around the upcoming NFL previews. And we'll encourage you guys to go to fanduel.com. Use the promo code Bet the Board. Take advantage of your no sweat bet up to $1,000. There are some conditions that do apply, so be sure to read that fine print before you put your money to play. Last and final order of business pain as we put a nice tidy bow on all things college football preview podcast around the Bet the Board headquarters is finding a best investment as it pertains to something in the college football ranks. All of the investments we've made in the SEC on win totals and futures are pretty much gone in price. So let's kind of navigate outside the SEC. And as everyone knows, or at least one specific fan base would like to think that I'm a homer. I am not. We're actually going to go with the Miami Hurricanes to win the ACC at plus 650. Shop around. That price is available multiple places. This is more of a play on the coastal division being poor than buying into Miami. 
you have UNC losing a historical quarterback. Virginia Tech, Virginia, Duke all have new coaches. Georgia Tech is Georgia Tech. We're down on Pittsburgh. Obviously, that was a a best bet win total we gave out a couple months ago. But it's not just finding something to bet, but it's knowing how to bet it. And I think that separates betters in this market. I'm going to put it nicely. And so if you want to bet Miami to just win the Coastal, you'll find a price of anywhere from plus 120 to plus 160. The far better bet is taking the plus 650 to win the conference. And if Miami ends up playing Clemson, they'll be about a four-point dog by our projections. And that translates to minus 190 as a favorite for Clemson. You can easily hedge down the middle there before the game even starts and earn way more on Miami that way than going just to win the Coastal. Or they may not face Clemson, and you end up with an even larger edge and an ability to assess that future, uh, you know, kind of in a one-game vacuum. So let's go with Miami, the Hurricanes, plus 650 to win the ACC, Todd. See, you read my mind. I was going to ask you, uh, inevitably, we're going to have listeners that ask, well, if you guys like them to win the ACC, should we bet them to win the Coastal? So you are indeed staying one step ahead of the curve. Do you feel like a monumental weight has been lifted off your shoulders now that you can put the college football preview series in the rear view and focus on your true bread and butter with eight divisional previews coming up during the month of August? I do. And this was a nice little, I mean, we... 14, 16 hour days finishing up most of our college stuff in terms of futures and win totals and then going over just about, you know, 130 plus teams and then, you know, doing enough to have these previews. And we're recording this, our listeners won't know this, but we're recording this on a Sunday, the first time we've ever recorded on a Sunday, to my knowledge. It'll drop first thing Tuesday morning, but I'll be on a flight uh, Monday morning. So a little, a little business, a little, pleasure setting some things up for football season uh, and then back and i believe we are starting our eight nfl division previews on the 4th of august whatever that thursday is busy month ahead busy two months three months four months five months until they hand out that lombardi trophy uh in phoenix in the middle of february but why don't we Thank all of you, our loyal listeners, uh, whether this is the first preview podcast you've tuned in for or you've listened as we've gone through them one after another. Appreciate all of the feedback, all of the comments, and everything else that you guys share through the social media community. So pass it along to your friends, pass it along to your family. Let them know that these things will be on the shelf and provide great study aids from now until the start of the season in late August. But we've tried to cover as much ground as we possibly can for a lot of the power programs in the biggest conference. Conferences of all. Any final words of wisdom, uh, things that you'd like to share, pain with our uh, listenership before we bid them a fond farewell for you know seven to ten days? No, I was shocked we didn't eclipse the two hour and fifteen minute mark. We're on pace for about two oh seven. Let's let's get out of dodge here. All right, for Pain Insider, I'm Todd Furman. You can follow both of us on social media. Hopefully, with a Miami Hurricanes. ACC Conference Championship ticket in hand in early December. We'll see you at the window. Thanks for listening to Bet the Board. You can catch Todd and Payne every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday during football season, breaking down the biggest NFL and college football games. And to make sure you don't miss any free best bets, subscribe to Bet the Board on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.